the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Welcome back to my colleagues for Wednesday debate in the legislature, to all those who are tuned in at home, and to all who are tuned in to today in our public gallery. I see the member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, uh, Sherbrooke, has a great cheering section here today, but uh, just to remind them that you can't cheer loudly externally. You can do as much as you can internally, <laughs> but you'll have to uh, mind your P's and Q's in the, uh, in the public gallery. But welcome, uh, nonetheless, to everybody who's joined us today. Uh, Madam Speaker, while I had the privilege to attend the Remembrance Day services at the King's Playhouse in Georgetown recently, uh, it became known to me that uh, John Conley will be taking over as the general manager of the King's Playhouse. Uh, uh, John, who's a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, uh, successful uh, uh, creative artist in his own right, will do a wonderful job there following the shoes of Haley Zavo and Catherine O'Brien, who have laid a great foundation uh, at the King's Playhouse. So I just wanted to wish John the best of luck, and he'll be welcome with open arms in the... Uh, still in my heart at least, Madam Speaker, the capital of Kings County in Georgetown. Um, I also wanted to say that it was uh, tremendous to read the story today of Nicole Drakes, uh, originally from Jamaica who moved to PEI a couple of years ago to study at the Culinary Institute at Holland College, uh, opening a bakery uh, in the beautiful village of Morrell. And I just wanted to wish Nicole the best of luck and to let her know that she will be a great addition to a wonderful community in that village in, in Morrell. And I wish everyone to get out and support that uh, uh, wonderful initiative of entrepreneurship. I also wanted to say a special hello to the staff and students at Summerside Intermediate School who will be hosting this weekend the 46th annual Glenn Edison Memorial Tip-Off Basketball Tournament. Uh, this honors uh, the memory of Glenn, a former teacher, principal, and longtime basketball coach at Summerside Intermediate. Uh, so all the best to all the teams participating. And I wanted to say finally that it was really nice to hear uh, from my colleague, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that the Berg and Nook in Alberton uh, recently held its grand opening on November the 20th, a thrift store in Alberton, which opened first in 1986, uh, operated by the Western Hospital Healthcare Auxiliary, raising money for the Western Hospital. So I wanted to congratulate uh, all of the auxiliary, uh, Emmanuel, uh, Lillian, all who are there. And of course, our Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, we know him in our caucus to be very thrifty with his dollars, and likely so, uh, with his uh, with his uh, uh, choice of wardrobe. So I'm sure he'll be a regular there, and it's good to see him at the grand opening. <laughs> and I wish uh, I wish the uh, the Berg and Nook on Main Street in Alberton uh, continued good luck raising hundreds of thousands of dollars on an annual basis for the Western Hospital. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Of the opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all those who are watching online and those in our public gallery. It's nice to see people from up west in the house. Uh, and while we're talking about up west, and I guess in particular uh, the guests that we have from District 23, um, Grand River um, Ranch in, uh, in the member from uh, uh, Tye Valley, Sherbrooke's area, um, we have a few uh, individuals from, uh, from my district who attend there three days a week to do some. Uh, um, horse riding, uh, and I want to thank Grand River Ranch for everything that they do. They're so inclusive. Um, in talking to my constituents, they can't wait uh, to get on the bus to go down to the farm and participate in every event they have, whether it's from crafts, whether it's from uh, cleaning the, the stalls, to grooming the horses and to riding the horses. And uh, they do a, a wonderful job, so just want to put a shout out to everybody that works there and all the wonderful things they do. Uh, to, uh, to help Islanders, Madam Speaker. So, usually I'll leave to Ignish around 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, today, I was up a little earlier. The dog cooperated. So I was able to get out at 5.25, and it's a wonder. The Eugene's drive through opens at 5.30, and I was on Church Street waiting to get in off of, off of uh, the street that goes into the drive through So there's that many people that are out and about in our area, and I don't normally see that that early in the morning unless it's fishing season. And then it's at 4 o'clock in the morning. So uh, it's nice to see that everybody's out and about and active uh, in the uh, town of Tignish. Um, and Memini Gash 
day, not Memory Gash, Memory Gash Christmas. Yesterday I mentioned a few that were happening in the area. Memory Gash Parade will happen on December the 15th, so just let everybody know if you want to put uh, an entry into the parade. Um, it's December the 15th at 6 p.m., starting in St. Louis, uh, following Union Road up to Memory Gash Fire Department, where they will meet special guests and there will be treats uh, provided. And I'm hoping to have the buoy tree uh, ready for lighting on that night also, Madam Speaker. So with that, welcome everybody to the ledge today, and uh, we have some work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to, to all my colleagues and everybody tuning in from around the island in Charlottetown, Victoria Park, especially, and, and welcome to everybody joining us in the gallery today. It's good to see some faces in there. Um, and. I don't see her here right now, but I just wanted to say, I, I know I spoke about it yesterday in my greetings, but I just want to officially congratulate and Emmeline Stanley for winning the Frank Zakem Rotary Youth Parliamentarian Award. I can tell you, there were a lot of deserving students in there, and Emmeline, good job. Um, so uh, just very briefly, the City of Charlottetown is in the next phase of community engage engagement for updating their uh, cultural policy. And so they're inviting the public into an arts and culture open house today from 3 to 6 p.m. in the auditorium at the Charlottetown Library Center. And there you'll have the opportunity to review and respond to the new cultural policy draft and contribute to uh, developing collective vision for arts and culture in Charlottetown. So if you have some time and you're any way interested, please pop into the the Charlottetown Library Center to have your say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone that's watching from District 23, uh, Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. I just want to point out a couple, as the Premier had mentioned, a couple of guests in the house there, but welcome to everyone in the gallery. But um, a, good, uh, a good district supporter of mine, Ann Christopher, is here today. And of course, uh, my biggest supporter <laughs> would be my wife, Marlene. In which I know I wouldn't be here without her support. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, just rise to say hello to everybody in District 14 and everybody watching from the gallery. It's great to see see everybody and. To my friend uh, Alan Sparks, uh, thanks for coming in this session so many times, and it's great that you participate in democracy. And you know, for me, it's, it's you're we're going to be we're going to be here for you. We're going to push. Um, just want to say hello to uh, a special constituent in my area that was on uh, the radio this morning. And anybody who knows him knows his voice right away. Uh, George Halliwell was on there this morning talking about uh, the great programs he's done for a number of years. Uh, regarding hockey gear um, for for kids that that you know uh, finances should never be a, a barrier to participation and and George has has done him him and his brother have done an incredible job with this so I want to say hello so say hello to him and and uh, and just say that you know next time uh, I get a pair of skates he puts them on the wrong way so I don't play much <laughs> hockey and I don't know why he did that no he didn't do that so but anyway listen George thanks a lot for all you do for PEI and uh, you're you're uh, you're you're one to follow thank you member from Rusko Emerald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome everyone watching from District 18, Russell Co Emerald, and those to the gallery as well. It's nice to see you folks, and good to see you. Of course, you have a connection to North Russell Co as well, with your sister Estelle being there. So nice to see you in the gallery, and it's nice to see three District 18 constituents in the gallery here today. Uh, Winky Park, who is the president of the New Glasgow Community Corp, and lives on New Glasgow, of course. And then we have a couple of new constituents, relatively new, to uh, Rustico, came from the, the East, the Minister of Finances District, I believe, but uh, it's nice to see Jane Farkasson and, and Doug Crossman here, uh, two of the driving forces between the North Shore Climate Action for Resilience Group, and in fact, we may see some cooperation between the New Glasgow Community Corporation and the, the NASCAR group as it is going in the future, so stay tuned. And. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, I, I wanted to say that tonight, in fact, uh, NASCAR has collaborated with Golf Shore Consolidated School 
um, as part of a uh, climate challenge funds initiative. And uh, Elder Matilda Knockwood is, is having a dinner there tonight at 5.30 talking about traditional ecolo ecological knowledge on climate resilience and environmental uh, conservation. So that's going to be an, an excellent milestone in that project as well. And uh, Madam Speaker, I wanted to, to congratulate Kate McQuarrie, also from District 18, such a, a great expert uh, in wildlife. She won the um, Friends uh, of the Farm Award, um, to the Jan Janice Simmons Award from Friends of the Farm, in recognition of significant contribution to the protection, preservation, and management of public green spaces on PEI. So I wanted to congratulate her, and I won't even go into all of the wonderful Christmas events that are happening in the district today, Madam Speaker. <laughs> from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. We all thank you for that, uh, Rusko Emerald. Uh, I welcome everybody to the gallery and everybody to another day of great debate here in our legislature. I want to I, I want to celebrate some special women today, and I'm going to start by adding my congratulations to Emmeline Stanley for winning the Frank Zakem Award. I uh, I was uh, sitting in your chair, actually, Madam Speaker, for part of the Rotary Youth Parliament. Lovely view from up there, and uh, Emmeline was sitting in this chair, actually, and there was some fantastic debate in this legislature. Uh, by these young islanders, and um, Campbell McNeil was another a Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action, a less blustery one than we're used to in this house, but he did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> It was, a, it was a really, fa in all seriousness, it was a really fantastic event and it was a pleasure and honour to be a part of it. Um, the second spectacular woman I would like to, to mention is Soleil Hutchison from uh, my district. Soleil uh, lives on the South Melville Road and she has a farm, Soleil's farm. She was recently married and she and her wife run this fantastic farm. And uh, she recently joined the PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women. So she will be a huge asset to that group. So thank you, Soleil. And finally, Maudie Wigmore, uh, I'm begging your indulgence, Madam Speaker, celebrates her 100th birthday at the Haviland Club this Sunday on December the 3rd. Maudie's an amazing woman. She lives in the Burnside Community Care Centre in... Uh, in Clyde River in my district and she that event's going to happen at the Haviland Club and there will be no doubt some good chat and some food and drink and maybe even some dancing. Maudie is still up for that at 100 years old. Thank you very much, Ben. Statements by members beginning with the member from O'Leary and Verness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have been asking questions in this legislature of Maritime Electric, a subsidiary of Fortis Incorporated, on how islanders receive electricity and how much islanders pay for electricity and will it be reliable and cost-effective service in the future. I want to note that Fortis, who wholly owns Maritime Electric, has holdings in the assets exceeding $66 billion and operates in areas all across North America and the Caribbean. They posted revenue of $8.69 billion for the year ending June 2023. To be clear, I am not against corporations making a reasonable profit. Taking risks and being innovative in delivering a service to its customers is important. But what we have witnessed under this government is no willingness to protect islanders from corporate monopolies, which is exactly what Maritime Electric is to over 84,000 uh, households. During the upcoming hearings with IRAC, Fortis is seeking yet another rate increase to cover $37 million in cleanup costs that result from a hurricane. The minister responsible for energy has the option to request intervener status. He so needs true. to defend island rate payers by holding large so corporations true. to account. He needs to make sure this is not an attempt to bill islanders for issues that were caused by negligence in not maintaining the infrastructure up to industry standards. It's the minister's responsibility to make sure Islanders' expectation of reliable delivery of electricity is effective, regardless of where they live in PEI. And to prove my point, I tabled pictures in this legislature yesterday that we see how power poles well past their expect expectancy and vegetation growing up through electric lines. Maritime Electric CEO recently stated in an interview that trees fell on the line were outside his responsibility. Why didn't Maritime Electric ask landowners if they could do extra trimming or risky vegetation? And this company has other issues. Do they have the capacity to deliver three-phase power where needed? We are moving towards electric cars, heat, operations. Does Maritime Electric have the ability to balance the load if extended periods of cold found our way to the Atlantic region? Will rolling brownouts be a reality in PEI in the coming months? Will a battery storage be a possibility? To conclude, why should Maritime Electric get 
a guaranteed 9 point plus percent margin on a capital investment on distribution lines that came down due to vegetation management that was significantly below industry standards. How is that a replacement of infrastructure that already existed? There are many unanswered questions around this essential service. It's time to expect better of those responsible for answering these questions, and it's up to government to do its job by monitoring this company with proper oversight. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it is a pleasure to rise today to recognize Kim McNeil and Nancy Burt, a 30-year milestone of practicing law in Charlottetown. Burt and McNeil was a law firm formed in what many might know as Sherwood, with partners Nancy Burt and Kim McNeil in 1993. There was a focus on real estate, wills, estates, and adoption law. As well as practicing law, Kim had interest in helping her community as a member of Habitat for Humanity, Prince Edward Island, and the Sherwood Home and School. Madam Speaker, Nancy was active in her community as a volunteer, being involved with Canada Winter Games and the National Gymnastics Championships, and both spent time teaching law at UPEI, teaching business law at UPEI as sessional professors. Kim and Nancy not only spent years supporting the community, they are both lifelong, lifetime friends. I'm excited to see both these ladies exploring new options and perhaps enjoying a little more time with family and friends. Thank you both for all that you've accomplished over the last 30 years, and congratulations in reaching this milestone. The old member from Rustico Emerald. Uh, Madam Speaker, today I'm pleased to recognize the North Rustico Lions Club for their ongoing support of service dog guides. Service dog guides assist Canadians who are 14 years or older and have a physical or medical disability. These dog guides are trained to fetch objects, open and close doors and appliances, push automatic buttons, and get help by barking or activating an alert system. And each year, the North Rustico Lions Club holds a, do holds a dog walk for guide dogs in support of the Lions Foundation of Canada Dog Guides. And last year, with the help of clubs like North Rustico, the Canada-wide Pet Value Walk for Dog Guides raised $1.2 million, Madam Speaker. In addition, this year, on November 4th, 2023, a delegation from the North Rustico Lions Club traveled to Oakville, Ontario to visit the Lions Foundation of Canada Dog Guides in person. And through the success of the North Shore Chase the Ace, they were able to make a $10,000 donation. This donation will go towards a new dog kennel, and the delegation was very pleased to get a wonderful tool of facility. Now, Madam Speaker, Lion Randy Pino is a longtime advocate for service dog guides, but was unfortunately unable to make the trip. However, at the Lions Club meeting on November 16th, Randy was recognized for his dedication and passion towards this cause as and was presented from, with two gifts from the Lions Foundation of Canada Dog Guide School, a hat and a vest. Madam Speaker, a huge thank you to the North Rustico Lions Club and Randy Pino for your work supporting service dog guides and the big difference it makes in our communities. Questions by members, uh, beginning with uh, responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the opposition has been um, waiting impatiently uh, for, for something I committed to take back to them, and I'm happy to say that staff has uh, finished compiling the incident reports from the Charlottetown Outreach Centre, and uh, they've been reviewed, compiled, put together. I expect they'll be delivered to me from the printer upstairs here shortly, and I intend to table those uh, later this afternoon. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. But I think he made the same uh, statement uh, a few weeks ago on a different uh, uh, ask, and we have yet to receive it. So we'll wait to see uh, if it gets here today or not. So, uh, Madam Speaker, question to the Minister of Justice. Last week, the minister said it was important for citizens or anyone to report illegal activities. And to quote, if the member sees something illegal, report it. If your constituent sees something illegal, report it, end quote. So those are pretty clear directions, and they come from the province's chief law enforcement officer. We know that the Minister of Housing was aware of the, the illegal drug use at the Outreach Centre uh, property in Charlottetown this summer. So did the Minister of Housing report this illegal activity to the Minister of Justice? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities? Justice. Justice? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, no. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 
Um, Madam Speaker, I'm sorry, I did not hear that response. Uh, could I have the member please uh, stand up and respond again so I can hear it clearly? Honourable Minister of Justice. Madam Speaker, um, I'll speak a little louder, but uh, no, I have not. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Okay, the question was not no, have you, the answer was no, have you not. The question was, did he report any illegal activity to you? So, and you said no, you have not. Your, your response was no, you have not. So, Madam Speaker, um, we'll move on to another question to the same minister. The Minister of Housing said he had um, phoned a number of landlords. Um, well, actually, no, I'm going ch to change it to the Minister of Housing for this one. Uh, the Minister of Housing said that he had phoned a number of land uh, owners about potential sites for the Community Outreach Centre in Charlottetown. So will the Minister table this list of landowners he contacted and the nature of these discussions? The yeah, Honourable <coughs> Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yes, I, I, I did inform this House at some point that I, informally I uh, in, in an effort to uh, come up with uh, potential options, I did some touring around the, uh, uh, the city and indeed I, I did speak informally with a number of uh, property owners about what may or may not be available and um, uh, at this time those are, those are just uh, informal discussions that have gone nowhere uh, and uh, the potential that I might have to explore those in the future depending on how things play out. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. So, same as the questions I've asked from this side to that side, they've gone nowhere, Madam Speaker. So, this is the Minister of Housing again. On November the 23rd, the Minister said that government had purchased 140 units from the private market over a four year period. Now, I've asked the Minister for a complete list of those transactions, which include the list of purchased properties, the vendors, the listing agent, and the purchase price of each. The Minister agreed to bring this information back. Has the Minister brought them back? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, no, uh, I don't believe that staff has completed uh, that work yet, although I know that they took note of it uh, when uh, the request was made. And uh, like everything else, it takes time to pull together information and data. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that we'll have an opportunity to share that with the member when it's available. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would assume that that wouldn't take very long to do. So, Madam Speaker, question to the Minister of Transportation. Um, we are still looking for the appraisal that was done prior to the purchase of the Kearney Club uh, in Charlottetown. Now, I'll point out the Minister agreed to bring this information back and it still hasn't been brought back. So, I'm going to ask the Minister, have you brought back that appraisal? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And after the Honourable Member, uh, Leader of the Opposition, had asked for that information, Madam Speaker, I went back to my department. Uh, the appraisal was not carried out by Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, hon the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So, Madam Speaker, this is taxpayers' dollars, and there's over a million dollars on it. The member has the floor. Okay. So, if the Minister of Transportation said that they, he did not, or their department did not do an appraisal on the property, did anyone do an appraisal on the property? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And as I understand, yes, there was an appraisal done on the property. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So again, Madam Speaker, so he knows an appraisal has been done. He has access to it. Will the Minister bring back that appraisal? Did. Why didn't you bring it back if you had access to it? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And as I had stated uh, in uh, the answer to uh, uh, the Honourable Leader of uh, the Official Opposition's first question. I went back to the Department and our Department, my Department, did not carry that out. That, Madam Speaker, does not mean that I have access to that appraisal. Thank you. <clears throat> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, 
I'm not sure who would have done that appraisal, so I'm going to ask the Minister of Transportation. So you know that there was an appraisal done, so you must know who did the appraisal or who has that appraisal. Who has the appraisal? Because you don't have any questions. The Honourable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Drag him right to the end of question period with this, because he's got no questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, was there an appraisal done, uh, oh, Madam yeah. Speaker? Yes, there was. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, this is, this is very serious. I mean, this is uh, over a million dollars that was paid for a building of taxpayers' dollars. And this minister wants to play a game on this? I've asked several times. The first time I've asked was a few weeks ago about the appraisal. He said he was going to look into it and bring it back. He never did. Now today he won't answer a question and he thinks it's a joke. This whole outreach centre thing, they think it's a joke, Madam Speaker. So I'm going to ask a question to the Minister of Health. Now I've asked this before too. And like so much from this do nothing, uh, no answer, avoid responsibility government, no information has come back. So again, Madam Speaker, how many overdoses occurred at the Community Outreach Centre during the free drug use episode during the summer? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank for the question. Um, we did table the EMS reports uh, a, a week or two ago, I believe. Again, that do outline uh, the responses by our paramedic uh, teams. Uh, it does not give it by specific location. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So obviously, he's not concerned about it, Madam Speaker. So again, to the Minister of Health. How many ambulance calls have there been at the Community Outreach Centre since, since the centre opened? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, again, we have tabled uh, the responses from EMS. I'm not sure, uh, again, if, it's any, if we can do any better than that and, and give it by specific address. But again, that is the way they compile the data, and we have provided the, that information to the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Definitely, this Minister is not on top of his file, Madam Speaker. So, uh, I'm going to follow up to that last question. Uh, has the Department of Health or Health PEI conducted any examination of how many ambulance delays elsewhere in the province are due to the repeated and numerous calls at the outreach centre? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I, I don't understand the implication that the member is trying to make. Uh, we want to serve our citizens no matter where they are with our paramedic services, uh, whether that be at the outreach centre or a hospital or a rink. Uh, we want to serve anybody. Every island deserves access to our ambulance. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yes, you're damn right every islander deserves access to, to an ambulance and, and timely health care response. And the, these individuals in Prince Edward Island are not receiving that. There's a problem here, and you guys are avoiding the problem. You have to address it. So question to the Minister of Justice. How many incidents have the city police responded to at the community outreach centre since it opened? And further, how many times did the city respond during that period of free drug use? The Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, it is pretty galling to stand here and listen to this opposition leader talk about uh, issues, Madam Speaker. Uh, now he's sitting here obviously hearing what we've been hearing. Uh, for the last year, Madam Speaker, or more, that these poor individuals who are addicted to drugs or alcohol need our help. They need our uh, help when you're dealing with mental health addictions. The third party gets that, Madam Speaker. The government gets that. And I'm awfully glad that the leader of the opposition finally gets that, Madam Speaker. And now he's lobbying for them to get help, Madam Speaker trying to do over here. He's been begging me to do nothing, Madam Speaker. We will not do it, Madam Speaker. We'll help the vulnerable island population because they deserve it. So it's great, Madam Speaker, that the uh, Premier found his way back to the House. Um, if he had to listen to my uh, questions. Honourable Member, you're walking the line and I'd like you to just rephrase that question, please. You're not to bring attention to people who are not in the House and I would prefer if you did not use defamatory language in this house. Okay, my question then will be to the Minister of Justice, Madam Speaker. How many, I'm going to ask him again, how many incidents have the city police responded to at the community outreach center since it opened? And further, how many times does the city respond to during the period of free drug use? The Honourable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I don't get those reports from Charlottetown City Police, but I will request and see if uh, I can have access and bring it back. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So there's going to be one big truck out here someday with all the responses from this government. So I'm going to go back to the Minister of Housing. Now, we know there's a draft environmental assessment at the Park Street property, and I've asked for that, and I am still waiting. Has the Minister brought that back? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Madam Speaker, thank you very much, and thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm, I, I know the request was made. I, I'm not sure. I'll have to speak to staff where they are with that. I wasn't sure the uh, policy on draft uh, documents being tabled in this House, but um, someone would, could stand to uh, correct me on that. But I'll point out that uh, there is still environmental assessment happening down there. Uh, I expected someone might ask a question about uh, some of the equi heavy equipment that's on site down there. They're still drilling cores uh, to get a better uh, idea of exactly what the, the situation is on that property. But the, the, as we've stated here before, the draft document is enough for us to move forward with the application that we have in front of City Council right now. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, so a question to the Premier. Yesterday, I brought forward concerns from the Minister of Health constituent who also reached out to you, but in typical fashion, you did not respond. So question to the Premier, will you commit to personally responding to the Ministers of Health constituent regarding the $27,000 of expenses his family has incurred as a result of his child's off-island medical care? The Honourable Premier. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, the Salvation Army is contracted by your department, Minister of Housing, um, to provide, amongst other things, the following at Bedford McDonald House. The agency shall accommodate an allowable tolerance of client intoxication, a harm reduction model. I will give you one example of many where this did not happen. A man received a list of requirements, and I'll table it, he had to meet before he could access the shelter bed. The first one on the list was to be sober every day for a week. The history of this gentleman is that he was incarcerated 124 times in the drunk tank, some would call it. Why? Because he wasn't able to access a shelter bed and the police, showing compassion, had no other option but to take him to Sleepy Hollow to have a warm place <coughs> out of the elements. So many questions. Why wasn't this man given access to case management? And why, given that the shelter is supposed to be operated on a harm reduction model, that he was not permitted to access unless he was sober for a week, which is not something he could do. I'll remind you that during COVID, the CPHO opened up liquor stores because they have recognized is there the danger. A question, member? Question to the minister. How is this in any way meeting the requirements of the contract to accommodate allowable tolerance to the client's intoxication when he was told to be sober every day? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I, I think I know where the follow-up questions may be going on this. But uh, let me say that I, I appreciate the <coughs> member's question and his advocacy on, uh, on behalf of this individual. And... You know, we need to know when uh, incidents happen that may fall outside the parameters of contracts we have with, uh, with um, people in our department. And uh, certainly I hope that uh, these have been brought to the attention of, of, of my staff. And uh, we work with our contractors to comply with the conditions of their contracts uh, when we're aware of, of any breaches. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. And what I'm saying is that we're not doing a good job. It's a disjointed system. And for, um, for the Premier to talk about that you're the only one, no, we're not the only one. These questions have to lead us somewhere. Our system, the way that we organize this has to be done in unison and people have to be treated with respect. The shelter system, will you review the shelter system's policy regarding everything to make sure that it's coordinating together for our most vulnerable people? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I assure the member that uh, our staff will have a discussion um, with our partners to ensure that they're operating within the parameters of the, uh, the contracts that they've signed with us. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, looking at the capital budget, 
we're debating, there is only one allocation for funding, one transitional housing project that is Smith, Smith Lodge, also known as New Roots. Minister, how do you plan to increase the provincial transitional housing stock with any other, are there any other funds allocated? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we currently have uh, about 37 beds of, um, of supportive housing under construction in the province right now. Uh, we do have a particular focus on transitional and supportive housing, and uh, I think I've stated previously here that uh, we may be coming forward with um, uh, some announcements on uh, with that regard, but uh, I've spoken about the importance of it, the importance of having, uh, of, of uh, diverting and preventing people from using emergency shelters when possible, and support of transitional housing is, is important in that regard. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Minister, you have to go down and tour the location. It's not up to standard, it's not, it's not there. And yesterday in the capital budget, we heard terms like delayed, deferred, fiscal prudence, and we heard that about this location, which you're going to add 13 beds to, and it's not, not being done now until 26, 27. How is that an investment? That's the only document that I have to go on, and we see it got deferred, delayed, and pushed down the road when we need it the most. You're saying that we need it. The Minister of Finance says that your department deferred it. What are we doing with those 13 beds, and will you put them on, the, on, on notice that they will be built now? This was in the capital budget last year. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, <clears throat> the member is concerned about exactly where transitional beds will go in this city, and I can assure him that um, uh, although I don't share his concern about the specific location, I do share his concern about the uh, adding beds uh, in that uh, uh, particular part of the housing continuum here. And I assure him that we will be adding beds, we will be adding capacity, and I've already stated my understanding of the importance of doing that. <clears throat> the Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Madam Speaker, the Atlantic Beef Products Plant and Board is an island success story for agriculture industry. It endured the dark days of BSE, commonly known as Mad Cow, which was detected in Canada in 2003. Following a number of struggling years, it is now a successful business with beef products that have high demand right across Canada. Our local beef industry is benefiting from the plant's viability and the management team there today for their innovative approach to this facility. However, the legacy of Mad Cow still lives on. As specified, BSE risk materials are removed from animals over 30 months of age and need careful disposal, and it's highly regulated. Today, at great cost, these materials are shipped to Quebec, where a high temperature incinerators are found. Question to the Minister of Agriculture. Has your department explored the idea of the, helping the beef plant and looking at retrofitting the energy from PEI waste uh, plant here in Charlottetown to meet the protocols and deal with these materials? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, th I thank the member for bringing this uh, questions to the to the House today. And he is right. Uh, the beef plant is a success story, and all islanders and all the industry should take pride in where it is today because it is uh, one of uh, a small gem that uh, we have in North America, and they're doing a tremendous job. And the SRM is uh, is a, a concern going forward. Uh, we are doing an economic. Uh, uh, we have an economic uh, review going on on a digester for the SRM, and hopefully uh, that SRM, along with our dead stock and our seafood waste, can generate energy, Madam Speaker, that can go to the beef plant, can go to small communities, and that it'll be even a bigger success story. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The yeah, we'll member from O'Leary and Burness. Well, I'm going to say that's positive news, Minister, but, you know, the reality is those things had started back when I was Minister. This, that's five years ago. We've got to get these things moving here and trying to help, help with this. Uh, Minister, I do know you're a dairy producer and you know the importance of this issue and the need for a viable beef plant. You understand the complexities of issue. I have every confidence in you in that. Has your department had any discussions with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to see if there are comparable protocols in other jurisdictions that can help the plant dispose of these materials? As we are hearing that other jurisdictions don't have the same protocols that we have here in Prince Edward Island. So can we try to help this plant and make them more profitable and keep that material here in PEI and deal with it? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, uh, <laughs> 
I don't know if that file was still open when I got here, but it, 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 uh, it's a new file that we've been working on. But uh, if the member wants to take credit, a little credit for it, I'll, I'll, I'll give him a little credit. But uh, <laughs> moving forward, uh, and the conversations with CFIA is why is Canada still being punished for uh, BSE when the U.S. don't have the same regulations, strict regulations that Canadian farmers here do. So that's the uh, conversation we have to have. But as soon as we get this uh, biorefinix, this uh, up and going, Madam Speaker, it is going to be a great news story. We can take our, get paid for dead stock. We can get paid for our, our SRM, our waste materials on this island, and make energy, make fertilizer. It's all great news story. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At a recent PEI Union of Public Sector Employees Convention, frontline health care workers shared heartbreaking stories of injuries sustained at their work and the treatment they received after. During a time of health care shortage, we cannot stand for any of these value employees being injured. And if they are injured, they should be given gold standard support to help them get back to what they do best, caring for Islanders. Question to the Minister of Health. What are you doing to make sure health care workers do not get injured, and if they do, that they receive the support and treatment they need to heal? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Certainly during my tour, I, heard, I did hear about concerns about injuries, um, both from you know, dealing with patients and also the public as well, which was very uh, disturbing to hear uh, about violence and stuff in some of our health care healthcare facilities. So again, we do have to support them. Uh, we work with our unions and all of our pieces to, to help them get back uh, on their feet again, because we do value these workers immensely. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party for Supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are hundreds of health care workers off work due to injury, and many of them have spoken out about the disrespectful and substandard treatment they receive when they are sent to the Workers' Compensation Board. Question to the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Will you commit to a full review of the Workers' Compensation Board legislation and the processes used by this board? The Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for the question. Um, and I will certainly go back and, and look into what's what's happening um, and have those conversations with the staff at Workers' Compensation Board. The honourable leader of the third party, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We need to prioritize keeping workers from getting injured in the first place. But when they are injured, we need to ensure that they are treated with respect, providing support and treatment to help them heal. Unfortunately, the stories that we're hearing from workers do not paint that picture. A question to the same minister. Will you commit to speaking with the CEO of Workers' Compensation Board, who you know well as past clerk of the Executive Council, and demand better treatment for injured workers? The Honourable Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you again for the question. And I absolutely will go back and, and talk to uh, ensure that those that are going there are getting respect that they deserve, especially when they're injured. Thank you. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. New statistics on farm income were re released by Stats Canada yesterday. And for island farmers, they reveal an unsettling pattern which we've seen for many years now. Farmer seats are up, and that's good news, of course, but the revised numbers for 2022 tell us that those farm receipts are actually up over 11%. But farm income, which is the difference between those receipts and the expenditures, is down, way down, drastically, by over 65%. In other words, island farmers are working harder and harder, producing more and more food for less and less return. A question to the Minister of Agriculture. We've watched a steady erosion of farm income for years now. Are you concerned that this is having an impact on the number of young farmers entering the workforce and presumably, hopefully, taking over farms on PEI? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the member from New Haven Rocky Point for that question. And uh, I am concerned. I am, as you mentioned, the. Uh, the input, input costs are going up, Madam Speaker. The, the money's going up, but the input costs are going up way faster, Madam Speaker. And we have to uh, look ways, creative ways, Madam Speaker, how we can uh, help our next generation of farmers uh, sustain those, uh, this in, in industry that is uh, the input costs are increasingly getting higher. And we have to look at creative ways on helping those young farmers and uh, hope. <laughs> 
hopefully in uh, working with the Federation of Agriculture and other uh, stakeholders that we can come up with some solutions that uh, we can improve that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We all, we all hope for that, Minister. Thanks. Um, there are a number of factors that are making it harder to attract new farmers to the profession. The price of land is a, is a really central one. Capital expenses, as the Minister just said, and high interest rates, global competition in the marketplace, transportation costs, and of course uh, the climate emergency, to name just a few. If Prince Edward Island is to sustain a viable agricultural sector, and some are suggesting that that may already be in jeopardy, we have to improve the economic environment in which new farmers are entering the profession to the same minister. Apparently, this government has given up on the idea of a land bank. But are you open to other policies that would help new farmers, such as lease-to-own models, tax incentives for collective land purchasing, and interest-free loans for new farmers? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. If the, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. If there was a checkbox for all the above, I would check it right now, Madam Speaker. Um, it's some great points there, and it's something we have to look at. And. Uh, and uh, as we go forward, we, and we, we got to be creative. We got to uh, take our world-class products and make, we have to process them here, Madam Speaker. If you go through the ADL model, the beef plant that we talked about already, and the Cavendish Farms, those are three major processing facilities here on this island that we are so proud of. A value-added product that we are shipping off this island. We have to continue to build on those. So, and and. And as we look at climate change, let's, let's sequester carbon and get paid for it. That's our next generation of farmers. That's what they're going to do. Thank you, Madam. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point, your second Thank supplementary. Thank you, Madam. One of the other issues that makes farmingly, uh, farming increasingly hard on PEI, and perhaps the principal one, is the availability of land and, of course, its skyrocketing price. Under this government, over 14,000 acre, uh, acres of farmland are lost every year. And that's taking us in a place that was once known as the Million Acre Farm to an island with less than half a million arable acres. A question to the same minister. The Land Matters report, which was uh, issued under your watch, made 13 recommendations, but only one of them was termed immediate. And that was the one to restrict development in areas under provincial control until a province-wide land use plan is developed. Immediate is long gone, Minister, but when are we going to see those regulatory changes? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, farmland is, uh, is a valued commodity here on this island, Madam Speaker. And I do, I, do, I do want to say that I know that Statistics Canada file that everyone uses those numbers. I do have to, after seeing a, the State of the Forest report that's going to be released soon, uh, it gives us a more accurate, uh, not only on our forest, but our, our agriculture land. And I'm not going to speak any more on that, but the accuracy is that uh, it's a lot lower number. And that's the number that personally I see and the farming community sees. But it's something that we have to protect, uh, whether it's through uh, keeping our uh, tax, a different tax rate to keep farm in agricultural land, Madam Speaker. There's so many options that we have to look at here. And I, uh, working with the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities to ensure, and I have a commitment from him that to ensure that farmland will be protected for the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The old member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Islanders with an annual household net income of 75,000 or less are eligible for a free heat pump for their home. The process, as I understand it, is that islanders who own a home can apply for a free heat pump with information from your most recent tax assessments. The program considers your combined annual household income. Question to the Minister, Environment, Energy and Climate Change. Is this the process, as I understand it, uh, the process to determine el eligibility for the free heat pump program? The yeah, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Speaker, basically that's the, the process and when we <coughs> built this program we tried to remove all the barriers so we took our staff to do all the work so there wasn't a whole bunch of forms to fill out and, and try to do as much of it we could do in the front end. We didn't require people to go out and get the, their own quotes on heat pumps. We pre-approved uh, by way of our RFP a number of vendors who could install them um, for them. We've actually had two, maybe even three calls for RFPs now to add people to it and uh, we basically... Um, 
remove barriers and seven million liters of uh, furnace oil this winter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Stewart. Uh, Madam Speaker, as I understand it, this is the only program that considers a combined annual household rather than other programs we offer that only consider the household income of the individual, like the home renovation program or the seniors home repair program. The implication for this implication for this is that there are scenarios where islanders are not eligible because the combined income is considering the income of not only those who physically live in the home, uh, but for example, a senior who has moved into a long-term care home, but whose annual income counts towards the residence residences that their spouse still lives. So question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. Does this process of considering a combined annual income for the free heat pump program align with the process of other government programs? I don't, I don't know how they determine in, in other departments. I know that in our department we always try to show leadership on, on files and we were left a lot of mess to clean up when the Liberals came in. So it took a, we, we made the change in how we approached things. We didn't want to punish people, we didn't want to be mean to people, which is what happened the four years before we came to government under Wayne Brockman and uh, balanced budget and sharing sandwiches in airports and that type of thing. Yes. <laughs> and uh, what, uh, what, what I will say to you is this, is there's two things. One is we have an appeals process, so anybody who's been treated unfairly can absolutely appeal it and gets a very fair look when, when we go through the appeals process. We do our best to constantly update and change the, the, the way that we approach um, the the program whenever we find problems in it. So we know that we're not perfect. We're trying to put out a number of heat pumps really, really quickly. Uh, and I know that we have changes coming uh, very, very soon that are going to make further changes and ease more people into the program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, your second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Madam Speaker, a constituent of mine is struggling to receive their free heat pump, even though their income qualifies them. This is because his partner has moved to a long-term care, but her income is still considered in the combined annual income of the household, making him just over the limit. Uh, question to the Minister, you might already answer it, but will you take immediate action to ensure this situation does not limit the number of islanders who are able to receive their free heat pump in an effort to help PEI reach their net zero goals? Uh, Minister Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Absolutely yes. So this is, this is a problem that we don't want to have. We, there's, we want people to stay in their homes. We want them to be able to stay in their homes. And we don't want to punish people because they had a family member had to move into long-term care. So absolutely we'll fix that, remove it from the whole process so that we can have a, a clear thing. And, and just while I'm on my feet, Madam Speaker, I might take a, a moment to note when I came into this file in, in 2019, the Liberals had signed on to the Paris Agreement and done absolutely nothing. They sat on it for four years. They, get, no, they gave away free licenses and, and uh, free registrations to your car. <coughs> We've reduced furnace oil in this province by 35% in five years, which this winter alone will account for $10.4 million that will wow. stay in Islanders' pockets. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ever since GFL has taken over waste watch services on their island, Islanders have been complaining about the quality of the service. Often garbage collect collection just simply does not happen for certain roads, leading to stress for homeowners and residents on Prince Edward Island. Question to the Minister responsible for waste watch. Can the Minister explain why the quality of service seems to have taken such a drop? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. If I recall correctly, uh, uh, this was, uh, he had uh, a similar question set uh, back uh, a few months ago. Uh, with regard to that, though, uh, and I hate to answer a question with a question, but I would... <laughs> <laughs> a suggestion, though. First of all, I wonder if the Honourable Member uh, has uh, indicated to his constituents to reach out to IWMC, to the customer support line, and also if they have made these known, a uh, st strategic plan process has been undertaken by IWMC 
and if uh, the honourable member has made this known to his constituents that have voiced their concerns to him. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The honourable member from Kensington, Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand how the opposition feels right now. Another concern I've heard about is from businesses who pay for commercial hauling who are being peppered, that's right, peppered with extra fees and charges, often with little or no rationale for them. Question to the Minister. Does our contract with the IWMC contain any protections for businesses being nickeled and dimed for fees and upcharges? The yeah, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and maybe we can give uh, the Honourable Member a fourth supplementary here. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd be happy if, if that could take place, uh, certainly. Uh, but. Uh uh, Madam Speaker, certainly with regard to businesses, those contracts are specifically between the business and GFL. Uh, IWMC is as a crown corporation, but IWMC is not involved in those uh, arrangements or those contracts with individual businesses. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So we have residential customers who are getting questionable service, and now we have small businesses getting fleeced on extra charges. Question to the Minister. Is there anything that you can do in your power as Minister to bring some sanity back to these waste services and stand up for island consumers and businesses? The yeah, Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I do appreciate where uh, the member is coming from on this side. Reference, Madam Speaker, with regard to the strategic planning, uh, process. Uh, IWMC received over, I believe it was uh, over 3,800 replies. Uh, they also had an open form uh, earlier uh, this fall. And one of the things as part of this whole process, Madam Speaker, is uh, the identification of problem areas. Uh, this information will be coming back to me from IWMC. Uh, with regard to the strategic plan, the identification of these problem areas. Uh, the plan will certainly be made public, Madam Speaker, uh, but I would certainly more than welcome the opportunity to sit down with the Honourable Member and review the information that is provided back. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Question to the Minister of Housing. Um, your department would have sent in a rec uh, request for 25 emergency shelter beds in Summerside, valued at $2.4 million, to be started in 23-24. Within a week, Minister, um, you've reduced 25 shelter beds down to 10 shelter beds in Summerside. It's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't understand what's happening here. Then you talk about, and before you say it's transitional housing, there's no transitional housing in Summerside in the capital budget. This show there's no plan. What do, you, what do you say about a reduction of 15 beds for the people in Somerset? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, earlier in question period, we talked about the importance of transitional beds, and now he wants us to forgo those to, uh, for more emergency beds. And I've talked about how we need to provide more transitional beds and uh, divert people from falling down to a crisis situation in emergency housing. So, you know, what was presented in the capital budget was a, uh, a, a previous iteration of what we were thinking. I've told you about how we worked on the ground with uh, officials in the city of Summerside to analyze the exact needs there. We've added, very recently, four new beds to the men's shelter on Winter Street. In, in Summerside, the emergency shelter. We have plans for 10 more, and we have plans for more uh, supportive and transitional housing in Summerside, Madam Speaker. The other member for Charlottetown West Royalty. That, I don't even know what a previous reiteration means. You're the Minister of Housing. Oh, whatever, I don't use those words. All I want is the beds. All I want is the beds in Summerside to be there. Um, in the capital budget, I would have loved to have seen those 15 beds under the transitional housing section, which the only project that you have, Minister, you, you punted down the road, NFL style, to 2026-27. Minister, this is not a plan. Between August and now, this is changing. The Minister was going to give you the money, $2.4 million for 10, 10 shelter beds. This makes no sense. And your process? Your process that went out to, to bidders is not void. You said those beds would be in before the snow flies. Is that going to happen, Minister? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. 
Well, Madam Speaker, let me just take a quick look out the window, and unfortunately, I have to say no. <clears throat> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, your final question. Let's make it a this question. Is, this is very serious. This is very serious because I expected more in the capital budget. It's not there across the province. Montague, no shelter bed. Summerside, I don't know what they're going to do with this. Charlottetown, people, the shelter system's full, Minister. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if it's not in the five-year capital budget to guarantee that we have transitional housing, supportive housing, and through the gamut? People don't have a place to live. What are you going to do now? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Madam Speaker, we presented a capital budget that is four times what it was um, just a few years ago. We have, uh, we, 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 I, I understand the, uh, the members' concerns about those most vulnerable in our province, those are unhoused or are precariously housed, and we're working hard every day to provide opportunities for them to get into stable housing in the community and uh, to serve their needs the best we can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The end of question period. Statements by ministers, the Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity and to encourage Islanders to, it, to attend the exhibition called Aquaculture Farming the Waters at the Eptec Earth and Culture Centre in Summerside. This display is an excellent snapshot of how fish farmers on PEI and across the country cultivate fish, shellfish, and seaweed species. It opened Tuesday, November 28th, and will wrap up on February 16th. As we all know, the aquaculture industry is a vital component of our province. For generations, for generations the industry has benefited our, our economy and continues to develop high-quality products that can compete in markets across the globe. To see our industry captured in such an interactive and fun way is something the whole family can enjoy and appreciate. A great team worked together to make this exhibition possible. The Prince Edward Island Museum and Heritage Foundation, the Eptec Art and Culture Centre, Canada's Museums of Science and Innovation have done an incredible job collaborating on this project. Madam Speaker, I'd also like to mention that the Summerside Art Club will be hosting its Aquadivision Aqua Aqua display, display during the same time. This exhibit features multimedia work centering around the theme of water. Aquadivision displays the amazing talent of our island artists. Both these projects capture the, the culture and importance of the aquaculture industry here on, here on the island and on a national level. I'm sure visitors to these exhibitions will enjoy the very educational and family-friendly environment and appreciate all the hard work it took to make these events happen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Vernis. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do appreciate the Minister and his statement as the uh, aquaculture industry in Prince Edward Island is so important. And uh, I know from my perspective, every morning I get up, I look out into Eel Creek and Fredericks Cove, and you see uh, a lot of the aquaculture leases, their cages, and they're, they're flipping them or they're uh, shaking them out uh, or sinking them. Uh, but I do find it rather interesting that this minister is actually promoting the fact that aquaculture and the display is actually in a museum because, uh, if you remind uh, this legislature, I've raised many questions in this legislature about uh, the issue uh, confronting the aquaculture leaseholders in uh, the Conway Narrows. And, uh, you know, they asked that they had to try to get moved. I think there was about a half a dozen of them that were impacted significantly by Hurricane Fiona. And uh, I will say that it looks like two are going to get moved out of that. And I, and I did arrange a meeting with the minister here the other day, uh, in fact, Monday. And I do commend and I thank the minister for actually going and hearing them out. But last night on my way home, of course, I thought I'd check with a couple of constituents just to see what they thought of that meeting. And they said a very, you know, I'll say a favorable comment. They did feel that the minister heard their plight and their situation, although they felt left the meeting that it doesn't look like there's anything that can be done for them. And uh, if that continues to happen, I know in this particular uh, leaseholder's case, he's got a sizable investment. I might add it's with Finance PEI. So he said, I don't know how I'm going to pay this all back if the, anything like this happens again. So I would hope that this minister makes sure that these leaseholders don't become a museum exhibit here in future in a year or two's time. So I just uh, wanted to acknowledge that, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Madam Speaker. I mean, I'll be a little more upbeat than my uh, <laughs> friend from, from <laughs> 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 Um 
No, I mean, it's a lovely announcement. The Ep Eptec Centre is a wonderful facility. You know, we have so many great spots around the island. I'm, I'm glad that this ex I haven't been over to see it, though it just opened on Tuesday, I understand, from the Minister's statement, but uh, I hope to be in Summerside at some point. It was there actually last weekend performing at the Scott Macaulay uh, perf Hall of Performing Arts at the Piping College there. Another beautiful facility. And anyway, we have so many great places in PEI, so many great exhibitions, so many great things going on at this time of year. And it's great to celebrate our uh, our aquaculture industry, as my friend from Malaria in Inverness says, a really important part of our, not only our economy here, but of our, uh, of the cultures and traditions of this place. And uh, glad to see the minister stand up and celebrate this. And I hope to go and have a look at the uh, at the exhibition over the holidays. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The honourable member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and the government whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I uh, thank you for your indulgence for this. I just wanted to say hello to uh, someone who just joined us in the gallery, uh, Sam McLeod. He's a constituent of District 10. He always tries to make it down for at least one day of the sitting of the legislature, and Sam is actually a former employee here at the Legislative Assembly. So thank you very much for stopping by, uh, Sam. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a report on incidents at the Community Outreach Centre aggregated by category for client protection. And I move seconded by the Minister of Health and Wellness that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. Carry. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a directive from Bedford McDonald House to Kenny Hodnot, who struggled with addictions like so many. This shows an abstinence model, not a harm reduction model. And on the last line, it says not to be at the every center between 11 and 1 p.m. And I move seconded by the leader of the opposition that this said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Sure. The honorable member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam. I don't think I tabled this last year, forgive me, if I, uh, last week. Um, it's a press release from Island Trails seeking confirmation that the Confederation Trail will remain a greenway. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table the aforementioned document. And I move seconded by the leader of the third party that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a series of pictures taken in the Bloomfield area of damage to the Confederation Trail by folks riding on ATVs. And I move, seconded by the leader of the third party, that the said documents be now received and do lie on the table. The Honourable Member from New uh, O'Leary, uh, Inverness. Is this committee reports? No, no. Oh, I didn't Sorry. have any tabling. Tabling of no, documents. Tabling. Okay. Honourable Members, pursuant to Section 38 of the Ombudsperson Act and Section 5 of the Public Interest Disclosure and Whistleblower Act, I wish to advise that I have received the 2022 Annual Report of the Ombudsperson and uh, Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner. I move that the report be received and do now and do lie on the ta table. Shall it carry? Okay. Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald. Uh, Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth, uh, the following receipt of a report on committee activities of the said committee on Tuesday, November 28th, yesterday. I move seconded by the Honourable Member from Surya Myra that the report of the committee be adopted. And your committee is pleased to be presenting its first report of the 67th General Assembly. The committee met six times to consider a variety of matters related to the committee's mandate. As a result of its deliberations, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendations to the members of the Legislative Assembly. One, your committee recommends that the government urgently develop a province-wide land use plan as the province's population is continuing to grow and additional housing is needed across the province. Two, your committee recommends that government support municipalities in recruiting and employing professional planners and development control officers. Three, your committee recommends that government provide municipalities with resources to assist with litigation costs when a development decision is appealed. Four, that the provincial government immediately implement province-wide interim regulations to further regulate subdivision and development in areas without an official plan until a province-wide land use planning framework is adopted 
as per recommendation eight in the July 2021 Land Matters Report. Number five, your committee recommends that government develop an action plan alongside the framework for population growth. <clears throat> Number six, your committee urges government to ensure all recommendations of the Reuben Tomlinson Report, University of Prince Edward Island, UPEI Review, are appropriately and urgently addressed by the university. Uh, Madam Speaker, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank all those who have either provided written submissions or presented to the committee. Uh, their knowledge and expertise has helped to shape the recommendations of this report. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the committee for their work and look forward to the continued work of this committee in the new year. Chala Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, and following the receipt of the report on committee activities of the said committee on Tuesday, November 28th, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member, New Haven Rocky Point, that the report of the committee be adopted. Tell Carey. Carey. The Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability is pleased to present its first report of the first sec session of the 67th General Assembly, and your committee met ten times to consider a variety of matters related to the committee's mandate. Your committee also had the opportunity to take part in a tour during this reporting period. And as a result of the deliberations, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendations to the members of the Legislative Assembly. It's a little longer than the previous committee, so bear with us, Madam Speaker. <laughs> On the topic of shoreline protections, your committee recommends that government support the implementation and maintenance of shore protection work along the waterfronts and coastlines to preserve existing infrastructure and development, with the goal of not actively intervening with the coastline itself, but rather working with nature. Number two, your committee recommends that government make strategic, science-based decisions to determine the extent of development setbacks from the shoreline. Number three, your committee recommends that government ensure that a reach-based approach to, is taken to uh, protection versus lot-based protection further. Your committee recommends that government develop planning rules that account for different types of areas across PEI's coastline. Your committee recommends that government uh, encourage and support the PEI Watershed Alliance to launch an education campaign around the benefits of not mowing the edges of properties, particularly those <coughs> along coastlines. Number five, your committee recommends that government establish mandatory soil erosion control plans for all clear cutting and development. Number six, your committee recommends that government explore the idea of green development standards that require all new developments to ensure green space is preserved for generations to come. On the topic of supporting our livestock industries, your committee recommends that government make concerted efforts to increase livestock numbers across the province and to explore the creation of a designated livestock champion to serve as an advocate and represent representative for the numerous livestock commodities. Number eight, your committee recommends that government provide increased supports to those in the livestock sector to promote efficiency and environmental sustainability, including the development of additional manure and storage areas. Number nine, your committee recommends that government create risk management programs for beef produ producers like those in other jurisdictions in Canada, and we've started that. Number 10, your committee recommends that government immediately work to create programs and resources to assist Atlantic beef products in providing forward contract uh, to beef producers as a temporary solution until price assurances can actually be implemented. Number 11, your committee recommends that government find creative ways to support the export of branded island beef and its byproducts. Number 12, your committee urges the government consider alternate alternatives for the disposal of specified risk materials known as SRM rather than the current practice of shipping the waste to Quebec as it puts island producers and our processor at a sizable disadvantage. On the topic of agriculture more broadly, Madam Speaker, 13, your committee recommends that government broaden and expand the agricultural curriculum within schools to engage young people in pursuing a future, uh, future in agriculture. Number 14, your committee recommends that government consider what supports and initiatives will need to be in place when those students begin their careers in the industry such as land financing and venture capital programming. Number 15, your committee recommends that government work alongside the federal government 
to create industry-specific emergency funding plans. On the topic of Prince Edward Island's forests, number 16, your committee recommends that government make concerted efforts to not only replant our island forests after Hurricane Fiona, but also to strive to emulate the Acadian forests that are indigenous to this province. Number 17, your committee recommends that government review the forest enhancement program and the incentives for participating in it. Your committee also urges government to review the qualifications and consider expanding them to include nonprofits and municipalities. Number 18, your committee recommends that both the provincial and federal governments work with the PEI Woodlot Owners Association to refine the definition of a commercial woodlot operation with some applicability to Prince Edward Island. Number 19, your committee recommends that government immediately adjust the building code according to the recommendation of the PEI Emergency Forestry Tax Force as outlined in the Minister of Environment's Energy and Climate Change mandate letter. Number 20, your committee recommends that government work with the private sector and other organizations such as the PEI Woodlot Owners Association to grow the province's forest economy by focusing on sustainability, economic viability and diversification. And 21, your committee recommends that government explore the concept of forest banking. On the topic of provincial developments and municipalities, your committee recommends that government do not impose a development on an incorporated municipality without the support and consent of that municipality and its residents. Your committee urges government to respect the municipal governments and their democratic process. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to share their knowledge and expertise uh, and that has helped us shape these recommendations of this report. I would also like to thank the members of the committee for their work uh, on this report as reflective of a quite a productive past few months. And I guess personally, Madam Speaker, I certainly commend the, you know, we have three parties, we all got together, uh, we did come up with a consensus report, not that everybody agrees with every letter of the, the statements here or wording, but, uh, but I really appreciate uh, that effort that everybody put in place. <laughs> back up here for a minute. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to speak to the report of the Committee of uh, Education and Economic Growth? Too late. Yeah. It's not too late. It's not too late. <laughs> and is there anyone who'd like to speak to uh, the uh, report that was just tabled? Okay, we'll move on. Um, sorry? Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said Committee on Committee Activities. And I move, second by the Honourable Member from Time Valley Sherbrooke, that the said be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. Madam Speaker, I would like to seek unanimous consent of the House to proceed with the motion of adoption of this report today. Does the member have unanimous consent? Yes, yes. yes. Madam Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Member from Time Valley Sherbrooke that the report of the committee be adopted. So I'll carry. Where I, so your committee is pleased to be presenting its second report of the 67th General Assembly. Your committee met 15 times to consider a, ver a variety of matters related to this mandate. Your committee is pleased to make several recommendations resulting from its work during the fall of 2023. On the topic of health care and retention, your committee recommends that the government consider all professionals who work within the health care system when devising retention incentives. Your committee recommends that government improve the timelines of the collective agreement bargaining process within the health care unions. On the topic of emergency medical services, your committee strongly recommends that government integrate currently incompatible charting platforms across the health care service providers in Prince Edward Island as soon as possible. 
Your committee recommends that government prioritize investments in the primary health care. Your committee recommends that government support emergency medical service providers in expanding care pathways. Your committee recommends that government support a program for low acuity transfer services for routine out of province patient transfers. Your committee recommends that government consider the implementation of a mobile health bus. On the topic of the unhoused community and those facing homelessness, your committee recommends that government decentralized services that provide support for the unhoused community and those facing homelessness. Your committee recommends that government review and the service model currently followed by the Community Outreach Centre. Your committee recommends that government make the change necessary to the services provided at the Community Outreach Centre to ensure safety of those using the services and the security of the bordered, bordering community. Your committee recommends that government expand shelter services to ensure that they are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Your committee recommends that government create additional support transfer housing options. Your committee recommends that government improve their data collection process to further understand housing insecurity and homelessness across Prince Edward Island. Your committee recommends that government consider options for creating supports for those who wish to provide housing in their primary residence. Your committee recommends that government commit to increasing housing supply of affordable and attainable housing. Your committee recommends that government ensure individuals and families who reside in, the prov uh, in provincial social housing are placed in spaces that are appropriate for their needs. Your committee recommends that government work towards establishing an overdose prevention site in an accessible, appropriate location in Charlottetown following community engagement. Your committee recommends that government consider the recommendations shared by Birchwood Intermediate Home and School to ensure the safety of students, school staff, and the greater community. Your committee recommends that the government support diversity in those providing shelter and related services through cultural competency training for staff and volunteers, implementing anti-discrimination policies and, and encouraging diversity through hiring practices. And finally, your committee recommends the government respect the autonomy of the unhoused individuals in making choices regarding their own health and well-being. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank all groups and individuals who presented on these important topics, as, the, as well as those who have provided written submissions, with supplement, which supplemented the committee's work. Thanks is also extended to those attending, to attend, that attended and participated in community public meetings across the island and shared their valuable feedback. And I too would like to thank all of the committee members for their valuable input and insight into all of these matters. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, thank you, Chair, for that, uh, for that summary of our committee reports. And I just want to stand for maybe a couple minutes to talk about how important the words that our Chair just read were. Um, it's, it's really a roadmap to some areas of, uh, some areas of this province that we've mess, messed up on. The unhoused community and those facing homelessness is a growing number is a growing number in our province and it affects everybody from tip to tip in some way, in some form. We have to do better and the first recommendation was a decentralization of services that provide support for the unhoused community and those facing homelessness. That's not the committee's words, that's from the meetings that we, we went on across the province. So we had four pretty amazing meetings with people that helped fuel this report. We had input from Islanders that helped fuel this report. We went out and spoke to Islanders about this. And we showed, hopefully, government how you have to do that. If you do not listen, if you do not go and speak to Islanders, we cannot get ahead. That's why things in the capital budget are so important, so that they can see the plan ahead. If we have no plan, where are we going? And a decentralization is exactly the opposite of what the plan that we have right now is. With the Park Street model, with, with the Outreach Center, we are centralizing everything. And PEI just said decentralize. So there's some things to think about and there's a committee report to take very seriously. When we have recommendations in here, talking about secure, security of the broader community, and Islanders that are trying to use the services. Those are serious. 
a table to document that outline this. I'm not saying it's you. We, successive government, we've all messed this up in the past. We can't afford to do it anymore. People are hurting. And the little things that you can do, people say, what, what should we do? You have to make, you have to make the, the shelter system 24 hours a day. It says it in here. Islanders have said it, seven days a week. It's not wraparound services to wrap around a clock. We have to wrap around the people. And the only way you do that is you provide them a place to go so that they don't have to come in here if they don't want to and listen to us jargon for four hours at a time because they have no place to go. We have to do better and that's something that's going to cost money but you will not find an opposition on this side of the house that says we're not going to, that's not a valuable investment. Transitional housing options, there's nothing in the capital budget. There's 26, 27, I can tell you what's there. That was here, that was in there last year. We have to do better. And I mean, the minister could come up, but it's, it's disjointed, there's no plan. The plan was the capital budget five year, and it's not there. And that's why I have a big consideration to make what I'm going to do later on the capital budget, how I'm going to vote for that. Data collection, we've been asking for this for a long time. And the numbers clearly show that whatever the numbers are, you can multiply that by 3.5, because that's the scope of the problem. So whatever the hypus numbers say, multiply it by 3.5. And there's where we can start in Prince Edward Island. And if we're not doing everything we possibly can now, we're in big trouble. When we have a recommendation 18 from Birchwood Intermediate Home and School, they represent a lot of kids from Stratford, from Charlottetown, trying to get an education in a junior high level, grade seven to nine. Are we doing everything we can to protect them? Are we doing everything we can to make sure that they have the best junior high experience ever? That recommendation's in here, and I suggest the government read it, because it's a very good one, and this committee basically took it almost basically word for word and put it in here. These are serious matters, and the autonomy of the unhoused people, we have to look at this. So when we walk by, when we, we have to go down and see, we have to be a part of, we have to understand what their situations are. And when we have a, a 75 year old person that wants to be in some place warm, we have to do something about it. When you get letters about that, we have to do something about it. These recommendations came from Islanders and I will fight for the next three years to make sure that their voices are heard and I hope we all do together and I'm sure they will. The last thing I want to thank is to take a standing committee on the road like that is no easy feat. And there's people in here that we barely see that work in here that made that happen. And I want to thank the clerk, and I want to thank those hardworking people that stayed around for very long hours in a very difficult month. You know who they are. Uh, and I'm, uh, every time I say hello to them, I look at the camera, so I'm not looking at the camera right now. But they did an incredible job, and I want to say thank you for them, an incredible staff that helped get this done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, I'm going to revert back to the chair of the Committee for Education and Economic Growth. Uh, he would like to speak to the report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do, I do appreciate that. Um, I, I was uh, uh, expecting to close debate on that, and there wasn't any, so I appreciate you coming back to me. I wanted to talk about uh, recommendations two, three, and four that have to do with municipalities. Um, and they talk about, you know, um, helping municipalities recruit and employ professional planners and development control officers. They talk about, you know, helping assist with litigation costs. And I know the Minister um, of Communities has introduced uh, legislation to try and reduce the amount of litigation that occurs for appeals and things. And then the last one, talking about uh, interim regulations to further regulate subdivision and development in areas without an official plan. And Madam Speaker, I, I represent a lot of area that is not incorporated, that's not part of a municipality. And so um, this, these, all these recommendations point towards this idea of we need to incorporate the whole island and we need to add in that extra layer of governance and we need to um, then 
provide additional resources to support that extra layer of governments to do things like official plans and pay for litigations and employ professional planners and things where, um, Madam Speaker, what my constituents for the majority are telling me is uh, they don't want to be part of new municipalities or existing municipalities. They don't want to see the whole island be incorporated. They would like to see province take control and perform these functions at the provincial level. We're 180,000 uh, constituents right now and uh, they feel that we can be managed as what would amount to a small city in, in, uh, in Ontario that way. And that, that's what's come, coming here to me. And this idea of, of forcing amalgamation and annexation across the island is one that my constituents are going to push back hard, hard against. So, uh, Madam Speaker, I just wanted to bring that up and, and be on the record uh, uh, saying that because I, I want to represent my, my constituents um, properly. I think that we can probably find a way to move forward. And we can do that in such a way that um, the services and amenities that are on our island, like arenas, um, for example, um, are paid for by all the people that use them, not just small municipalities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As Chair of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, I beg leave to introduce a report of the said committee, and I move seconded. Um, by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, that the same be now received and do lie on the table. Chair Carey. Madam Speaker, I would also like to seek unanimous consent to proceed with the motion for the report's adoption. Does the member have unanimous consent? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this report is an account of the committee's activities since it was appointed on June 9th. The committee has met on 10 occasions since then. And this report summarizes, summarizes the purpose of those meetings and the witnesses that appeared before the committee and the decisions that were made. The report includes the following recommendations, Madam Speaker. Recommendation number one. Your committee recommends the work done by the Office of the Auditor General and endorses all the recommendations made in the annual report to the Legislative Assembly in 2023, the COVID-19 financial support programs phase two report and the performance reporting phase two report content report. Number two, your committee recommends that government review its level of financial staffing across its department and agencies to determine whether it is sufficient to meet the workload demand. Number three, your committee recommends that details of capital expenditures be incurred by government business enterprises be provided as part of the capital budget process in the legislature. Number four, your committee recommends that government consider requiring post-secondary institutions to provide more detailed information on their spending plans as a condition of future funding agreements. Number five, your committee stresses the need for formal agreements between PEI and other provinces on out-of-province medical services and urges the government to make these a priority. And in conclusion, Madam Speaker, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to the Auditor General and his staff who do an incredible job. They took on a lot um, with the COVID uh, reports of phase one and two, and uh, they do an incredible job for Islanders. And also I want to thank uh, the Canadian Audit and a Accountability Foundation uh, for their professional assistance in helping this committee. It's a new committee. Public accounts is not easy. Um, and they came in to, to give us some guidance. I'd also like to thank the Vice Chair for uh, being Vice Chair and, and uh, helping out with that function. And, and I would also like to thank all committee members for working so hard on this committee. Thank you, Madam Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to the report? Okay, Michelle Carey. Carey. Introduction of government bills, motions other than government. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the 15th order of the day be now read. Michelle Carey. Order number 15, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Bill number 106, ordered for third reading. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, that the bill be now read a third time. Shall I carry? 
Bill number 110, an act to amend the farm machinery. Oh, sorry, apologies. Uh, bill number 106, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act. Read a third time. <coughs> Honorable Member, or Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that this bill do now pass. <clears throat> so this is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to a committee of the whole House, reported to, agreed to, with amendment, Read a third time, it is now moved that the bill do now pass. All those in favor say yay. Yay. Contrary, nay. The bill has carried. The Honorable uh, Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Leader of Alluria Inverness that the 16th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number 16, an act to amend the Fire Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act, Bill number 110, order for second reading. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the uh, O'Leary and Verness uh, that the said bill be now read a second time. Bill Carey. Carey. Bill number 110, an act to amend the Fire Machinery and Dealer, Dealers and Vendors Act, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by O'Leary and Verness that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Chair Carey. The Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair committee of the whole. The House is now a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Fire Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act. Uh, member, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Uh, not at this time, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, maybe a little later on, but uh, we'll see how this goes. I, I think I'm fairly up on the bill. That sounds good. Uh, do you have any... It's looking good back there, but, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any opening comments, or would you like to get into debate on the bill? Well, I, I do have some opening comments, just to say that the, the rationale behind this particular bill is in light of the situation that we're dealing with, uh, the technology advancements in the farm machinery industry, uh, we're certainly seeing uh, technology for computer codes and for uh, uh, just the advancements of the technology. And so what this issue really boils down to, it comes back to the issue around the who has the right to repair a machine that's owned by a particular individual. So if I said a person, a farmer, goes and buys a tractor, combine, and things of that nature, and there's a lot of advanced technology that go into uh, uh, this in electronics now, uh, when something kind of goes a bit wrong, uh, we're seeing in some jurisdictions anyway that uh, the mach machinery dealers are saying, we're not allowing you the right to repair that. And you have to uh, pay a certain fee 
to get that or to get that code. Uh, and I, I've certainly done some research on this regarding the issue. There's, there's issues around modifying the machine is one thing. I'm not proposing that in any case in this. It's about repairing in the machine. So the same thing even for more basic machines. When you uh, look for, uh, go into a farm dealer, I, I go many times myself to get, and you ask for, uh, can I get a picture of the manual or a, a, a copy of the parts as they go together? Now, in Prince Edward Isle, that has not been an issue. Uh, you know, they usually show you the, the computer screen or they'll give you a copy of that. But what happens if a farm vendor uh, a dealer decides not to do that? Is, that? is that just? Is it fair? So this legislation would mandate the, the vendor to at least provide a copy or the codes that it might take to uh, reset a computer and things of that nature. And they have to give them either to the farmer or uh, then we do see companies out there that do farm machinery repair. That's all they do. They don't really sell parts or things of that nature, but they uh, uh, repair machines. So same thing. If I was to get a third party to come in and repair my tractor or whatever, I would be, uh, I would, it would comply the, uh, the dealer to provide them that information. At, and I'm not saying that they have to give it to them for free, but they have to, you know, a reasonable cost of the photocopying or, you know, something fairly basic in, in that. So that's the premise behind what I'm trying to accomplish here. Uh, you've seen it in many jurisdictions around, it's called the right to repair legislation. And I guess in my research, and we, when I talked to uh, Neil Ferguson, I guess that this more falls under this particular act, the Farm Machinery Dealers Vendors Act. So that's why we're kind of putting it in under this. And uh, the premise, I guess, was to kind of give the, the minister some legislation here. And if there was regulations that had to be required, so, you know, to, it gets more specific into the, the fees that they have to charge or how much notice and things of that nature, then I guess I would have confidence that the minister could have the regulations. So that's the premise behind the bill. Thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, is it a pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause? No, I'm chair. All right. I'll open the floor for questions. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, Attorney General and the Deputy Premier. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Member. Uh, you were accidentally referred to as the leader of O'Leary and Inverness. Oh, well, but, uh, O'Leary and Inverness, maybe. But that's about <laughs> as far as it goes. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, there's people that wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this is intriguing. This is a very intriguing, uh, just from my my background myself in agriculture and uh, obviously since I've become in this role I don't uh, see the uh, the books anymore but my partner who took over the books uh, who is my wife she often notes that the repair bills are ungodly it way and, way up yeah on and they continue to rise and this has a lot to do with it and it's just not a certain brand, is it? No, I, I'm certainly, uh, yeah, remember, I'm certainly not recognizing any particular brand, but, but I think well, I'll, I do mention this one story, though, that uh, came out of it, and it, brought, it came back to the issue around the war in Ukraine. So I think John Deere equipment uh, it could actually shut down all the machines, all the John Deere equipment and tractors in, in say, Russia or Ukraine because of this. And that's, that's a lot of power that they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, another comment that I wanted to make on it, but just also imagine, you know, you go and buy a machine, you're making payments on it, and maybe you get a little bit behind. Farmers, you know, we have difficulties by times. And maybe you're just about to harvest a, a crop through your combine, and the dealer decides that you haven't paid, not, I'm going to shut your machine down. Is that just and fair? You know, I, I think that's, that's where I'm kind of looking at, uh, that, you know, there should be notice or, or uh, something that sort of at least provides the farmer with some uh, process that allows them to get that code back to start the machine back up, finish their crop, um, those types of things. So that, that's, I, I just guess what I'm really trying to say is that technology is advancing rather rapidly and I think that's only going to continue. And I think farmers who provide a valuable service and providing food for this globe uh, need a little bit of uh, leverage in uh, trying to deal. So that's the premise, once again, behind the act and, and why I'm kind of bringing it forward so that Prince Edward Island, at least the farmers in this area, have some sense of protection. Yeah. Minister of Agriculture. Um, that, that is interesting. I know, uh, I'll not mention the name of Tractor, but a uh, custom person that 
does corn, uh, middle of the night, they're, they harvest 24 hours a day. They just go. This equipment broke down, and they can't fix it. They stop. They have to stop. And uh, it was, and he, he couldn't fix it until the company hours started, but it was fixed over the, the internet, mm -hmm. uh, which was great if you break down between eight and five, <laughs> yeah. no matter what country you're in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Depends on where your service is. So um, I'm curious if you looked at. Agriculture is important to me and is important to this island. But have you looked at the fishing industry to maybe include it in your bill? Or? Well, I mean, you can, you can take the so-called right to repair to a far other extremes. I think actually the member from New Haven, Rocky Point, had talked a little bit about uh, some legislation around right to repair. And it can, you can get into electronics in your home and things of that nature. I, I guess from my end, obviously my interests are, are in agriculture. And uh, there is legislation already on record called the Farm Machinery Dealers Vendors Act. I guess that was my premise. I, I, I guess it's, it's how many people do you want to take on in this? And I, I would argue that... If this legislation gets to the point where it becomes law, then uh, you know maybe that's a, a good impetus for other uh, issues out there that uh, could be done on where how far you go with the, the issue of the, who, who has the right to repair whatever machine that a person owns. I think that's the key I'm really trying to emphasize here. You go buy a tractor, you go buy a combine, is it yours? I would argue that it is. You make you make payments on it. You you put the you know you borrow the money from a bank or a lending institution and you pay a vendor. What happens though when you bring it home and it doesn't work? And uh, do you not have, as the owner of that product, the right to repair it? If you have the technological capabilities, mentally or whatever. But if if the the dealer who holds the, the electronic code, so say if it's a, you know, a computerized thing that you have to uh, adjust, they, they hold that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing goes with a manual. They, they, have, they have that. <laughs> and it's not always easy to get those images and pictures and, and or these codes. So I, I guess I'm trying to argue that if you are the owner of the machine, you should have the right to repair that. Uh, now, I mean, you can work and negotiate and discuss with your, your owner or the dealer. There, there are great dealers here in Prince of I don't, I'm not trying to challenge or question them in that. But where does this go in future, and how far are we allowing them to flex their muscles in uh, something that they own? Now, it, it, it's a little different if they lease the machine. It's a little different, you know, if uh, they're renting the machine out. But when you actually go and purchase and own it, and my understanding is that most things are for sale, <laughs> that you, when you go into a dealer, they, 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 their first choice is to sell it to you. <laughs> their second choice might be to lease it to you. Their third choice might be to rent it to you. But when you own it, I, 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 I think you're paying money that you should have the right to repair and the right to, to get who you want to repair it. So like I said, you know, I, I, I know there's companies in, in my riding, or my area, I should say, that uh, do farm machinery repairs. They, they'll, they'll choose any machine, it doesn't matter the brand, the make, the model, any of that, and you'll pay them a fee. But they can be limited to what they can do in repairing that tractor because they might need the electronic codes when they put the computer diagnostic equipment on there to, to uh, adjust that. And uh, as we see technology advance, so they can do it from the dealership. But if they choose the, to not or they're difficult to get, it could have a significant impact on a farmer's bottom line. So that's the rationale, Chair, on why I... Minister of Agriculture? Yeah, thanks. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, the, the concept of this is, I think, sure. obviously outweighs the negative. The positives outweigh the negative. Uh, this is going to only benefit the farmer or the, the purchaser of this equipment. Do, but do you, is there any implications that you can see that might be an issue with the dealership? What's Say Green Diamond and Bloomfield, are they going to... Or you have, do you, will you have to go to Moncton if we pass this legislation? Well, that's, that's hard to predict, and that's hard to predict if we, whether we do or we don't pass the legislation. You may have to, because we're seeing a consolidation of farm machinery dealers, just less of them around, as there are fewer farmers and equipment gets bigger. 
but but I guess uh, you know in the end of the day the things that I would see that you know are questionable like what do they charge for that those fee codes what do they charge for uh, the, the, a photocopy I'm trying to say in this legislation that they have to charge a reasonable amount ultimately you as minister respond I think it's you as minister responsible for this particular act uh, would uh, would turn around and say there needs to be somebody you can appeal to somebody who can determine what's a fair and just fee I, it's hard for me to determine that but. But I, you know, I, I would hope that most dealers would be pretty fair and just on this. But it, it still goes back to, you know, uh, common sense. I would hope. But uh, but that, that, yes, there are risks. And how far do you go with it? And what's considered a farm machinery? You know, uh, you know, uh, I use certainly lots of things on my farm that may not be you buy at a farm dealer. But so you know, I'm just saying. That, but this particular case, we are focused on the farm machinery dealers who are vendors here in Prince Edward Island. And, Minister of Agriculture. Uh, thank you. And th this is my final question. I just, uh, when you do mention uh, if it's in my department, it's from my conversation with both of my departments today, Justice and Agriculture, uh, the legal opinion was it probably does, it's probably outside the scope of this act. It should be in, uh, uh, you know, it's contracts between dealers and vendors. So, um, and the definitions will have to be looked at. So I, I, I'd i love to see where this goes. I think this is an exciting, and I want to thank you for bringing this, but I think I would love to do more uh, in-depth look at this, see if we can uh, uh, go somewhere with this. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? or? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I guess in the end of the day, I, you know, I've done work in the respect that, you know, I did a, a deal with the legislative tools that I have in the legislature here, and, you know, I did approach uh, to say this is something I wanted to do as a right to repair for farmers specifically. I did a fair bit of uh, uh, research into other jurisdictions. Ultimately, I guess the recommendation to me was <laughs> that this was the, the legislation location of Farm Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act, which does sound kind of close anyway. <laughs> but, but I'm certainly open to saying if, if that isn't, and we have to either amend another act or, or it would be better in another act to have more uh, influence to, you know, your portfolio. Uh, I, I'm certainly open to suggestions. I'm open to amendments. I'm open to a number of things to try to strengthen this particular piece of legislation to meet the needs of our agricultural community of Prince Edward Island. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I, I'll be brief, but I really appreciate you bringing this to the floor, uh, Member. And three years ago, I think it was, 2020 or 2021, um, I brought forward a, a motion yeah. to this effect on right to repair. And at that time, and I don't know whether this is still true or not, but there were two other provinces that were considering right to repair legislation in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, neither of them had passed legislation at that time, but I think a federal bill just passed in October of this year, an amendment to the Copyright Act there, which is a federal jurisdiction, of course, and would have much more wide-ranging uh, implications for every, all provinces, including ours. And when we were looking at this, it looked like the, in order to have the biggest impact uh, for consumers, for islanders, the, the Consumer Protection Act looked like the place to go. And I realize you've talked that you're concerned principally and maybe entirely with the, the agricultural community here. I mean, well, I think my neighbor, Boyd Macquarie, has a whole slew of tractors. God knows how old they are, but he's been repairing them all his life and they're still running. How fantastic yeah. is that? Yeah. And these days, it's much more difficult to, uh, as the Minister uh, of Agriculture just said, to when you, when you break down, your, your options to repair it yourself are really limited. So I love the idea of this coming to the floor. I'd love to widen the scope of this. Um, but, you know, if we start here and if, uh, if we are the province to move this forward further than any other has, and I think if this were to pass, that would be indeed the case here, then that's very exciting. So I, I really appreciate you bringing this to the floor, and I look forward to the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Kensington Malpec. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honourable Member, for bringing this bill forward. Um, it certainly seems like there's some interest to make something work here, and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. and. Wondering if there'd be an appetite if uh, if I was to bring a motion to send it to committee, uh, probably the committee of natural resources for review, uh, just to try and strengthen it, make it the best piece of legislation, and and work towards getting it passed. 
Yeah. Well, from my perspective, like I said, I'm here as a, as a humble MLA from O'Leary and Verness. That's a pretty big farming community. I have to admit to the member of New Haven and Rocky Point, I am trying to focus on the agricultural sector. I like I say, how, how much do you take on in this? Um, and, uh, you know, I do think it is a, a bit of a, you know, Prince Edward Island, we're a leader in agriculture, certainly in the potato industry and the technology that goes on in agriculture. Uh, I think we can be a bit of a trendsetter here, although I will say that there certainly have been a lot of different jurisdictions in the farm community, especially in the U.S., that this, this has been quite a contentious issue, and there certainly have been certainly states that have, have implemented the legislation there. So, uh, uh, but yeah, to get back to the Kensington Malpex, uh, I mean, I would say I'm, all, I'm open to suggestions here. Uh, uh, I would hope that this bill doesn't die somewhere, that I can make some good of bringing it to light. Uh, I certainly would be receptive to uh, seeing it go to committee. Uh, my only little, I'll say, comment to it is that most of the legislation we've dealt with here was kind of like it was good enough. <laughs> Now all of a sudden we want precision and it's great. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I'm, on, I'm honored that this particular bill would be the, the chosen one to, to do that. You just need a leadership. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but uh, so you know, uh, so like I said, I am open to any motions uh, or amendments or or anything that would only strengthen this bill and, and try to get it to move forward. Yeah. Uh, Kensington Malbec. So, Chair, I would like to make a motion to move it to committee. Uh, how would the would so, uh, Honourable Member, in order to uh, to move to committee, we'd have to report progress as committee of the whole, and then that motion would be made forward when we're not in committee of the whole. Now, Honourable Members, I do have one more person on on my list to ask questions, or I guess the the sponsor of the bill can report progress at any time. Is that correct? So I'll put it to you. I do have one more person I'm on currently on my list. Do you want to report progress now, or would you like to take more questions? Well, I, th or? I think whatever who that person is on the list, I'd like to try to hear them. Well, that's the honorable member from Time Valley. Oh, well, well he's, he's, he, he, he would be a person that uh, would understand this legislation probably more than most. <laughs> But just Thank so you, you. you could report progress at any time, and then sure. that motion would have to be made outside of the Committee of the Whole. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honorable Member, for bringing it forward. Just have one question. Um, so this would be equipment, like if you buy something, I'm just thinking of warranty equipment. Mm -hmm. um, this would be for equipment out of warranty or for warranty? Uh, there's Because if you yep. start working on equipment that's in warranty and you don't do it properly, yep. Uh, you know, what's the yeah. consequences? Okay, Chair, to... All right. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, ultimately, when you, when you have a warranty, there's already an implied arrangement between you and the vendor, right? When you purchase that machine, you've paid for that machine, and there's a warranty that goes with that. Uh, this would really be after the warranty. So what happens after the warranty, uh, you know, that they won't give you the codes? You, you as a farmer, have very little influence on a machine after warranty is expired, right? And, uh, you know, if the technology is beyond what you can understand, or uh, or even to get the images, if I took a manual, as you've looked at many, many you know, lots of times the, the dealer will give you a photocopy of the man and how that part goes together. They might not tell you a whole lot, but at least you got that to go by. Uh, uh, so you at least have some recourse to ask for that information, and they have to provide it to you. So, so ultimately, it really goes beyond warranty. But like I say, if you go back to the member from New Haven and Rocky Point, he's talking about you know a lot of older machines. Those are you know there was some basic uh, technology there that many of us understood. Boy, I, I mean, I know my car today. If there's something goes wrong, I, I mean, it's beyond my capabilities. And uh, you know, so but I can t but I can take it to my neighbor who's a mechanic, and and he has computers to get. That some of that information. What happens if he wasn't able to get that, right? That, that's the issue. So I hope that explains it a little more yeah, detail. No, I, was just, that's the only thing I was thinking about. Yeah. I figured it was after warranty, but just make sure because yeah. there are problems. So I think with that, Chair, I, I certainly like to report progress on this uh, this bill. And I thank the members for at least uh, entertaining my, my, my time here to uh, bring this forward. You're good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't like that line. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry?
whenever she says shall carry. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee in the whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Farm Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Yes, the Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck. Madam Speaker, I'm seeking unanimous consent to move a motion without proper notice to refer Bill Number 110, an act to amend the Farm Machinery Dealers Act and Vendors Act to Committee. Does the member have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. I move second by the member for O'Leary and Verness the following motion. Therefore, be resolved that this House commit Bill Number 110, an act to amend the Farm Machinery Dealers and Vendors Act, to the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability for further study and consultation. Therefore, be it further resolved that the committee solicit and consider input from any relevant stakeholders and that committee determines its work plan to gather input. And therefore, be it further resolved that the committee report to the House with its findings and recommendations at its earliest convenience. Bill Carey. Carey. Would anyone like to speak to this? Okay. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I move, seconded by the uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty, that the 17th order of the day be now read. Chair Carey. Carey. Order 17, an act to amend the Planning Act Number 3, Bill Number 112, ordered for second reading. <coughs> Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the said bill be now read a second time. Bill Carey. Carey. Bill number 110, an act to amend the Planning Act, read a second time. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the House do now resolve itself and the committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. <clears throat> Honourable Deputy Speaker, Chair Committee of the Whole, please. The House is now a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Planning Act, just not three, but just the Planning Act. Uh, member, do you want to uh, make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, I would, please. Shall I carry? Back, Robert. Could you uh, introduce yourself for answers? My name is Robert Godfrey, and I'm the director of policy and research for the Office of Official Opposition. All right, honourable member, do you have any opening comments, or would you like to get into the debate? Uh, sure, and I'll get in. Just give a brief uh, description of the bill's intent. Basically, the overview of this bill, simply put, is to um, 
to build more housing quickly. Um, so given the current housing crisis that we see here in Prince Edward Island, I believe it's important to reduce red tape and limit who can appeal a development permit. Uh, the first proposed amendment aims to deter frivolous or speculative appeals to the uh, development permits by introducing the fee to the appealant. Um, and this is to solve the issue of needless de delays of new residential bills. Uh, additionally, another amendment will limit the ability to appeal uh, development permits to parties and or landowners who reside within 100 meters of the subject lands. As the Act is now written, um, uh, someone from Sherwood, for example, could appeal a development permit for a new housing in downtown Charlottetown without any reason. The next amendment uh, will ensure that no appeals lie from the decisions uh, respecting development permits for development permits for affordable housing as set out in the regulation. And lastly, the final amendment provides that no person who is not a party to the application may appeal a decision respecting a development permit more than once. So again, um, Chair, these measures aim to get housing uh, built faster and streamline the appeal process while ensuring genuine concerns are addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Uh, is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause? Okay, no questions. All right, my list is open. Uh, the Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, so we, uh, the government brought an amendment uh, to the Planning Act here just recently that's related to, to this. And uh, we changed the definition of um, somebody who is dissatisfied with a decision to an aggrieved person, which limits the scope of, of who can uh, appeal a, a planning decision. And um, just want to so based on these, uh, these amendments that you're bringing forward, um, do you have some concerns about how those two definitions of um, who can appeal a decision will, uh, can be knit together between the amendment we brought and now the amendment that you brought? Does our definition of an aggrieved person still stand in the act? And how does that reconcile with someone who's within 100 meters? Subject problem. I think what we've, I think what we've tried to do, um, Minister, is we've tried to go a little bit further. Um, we've tried to narrow the scope, uh, and this is largely based on feedback received uh, from the city of Summerside, uh, city of Charlottetown, and town of Stratford. Uh, they have sent a letter in, and I, I believe it's, uh, I believe it's in front of me here. Right here. It's also supported by the Federation of Municipalities. Uh, who, who made sort of the, some of these recommendations. So uh, we, we formulated this bill based on that consultation uh, and felt that we need to go further in, 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 uh, in terms of who should be able to appeal a development permit. I think, I think, what we're, I think we both share the desire um, uh, from what I've seen in your bill and this bill here in terms of making sure we get development, we get, we get houses built as fast as possible with, without delay. Chair? Sure. Chair? Sure. Yep. Is it now time? Yeah. Honorable, you want to report uh, yeah. progress? Yeah. yeah. Uh, chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. carry. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitulated an Act of Land and Planning Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Well, carried. Carried. 
The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Third Party that Motion 77 be now read. Shall it carry? Motion number 77, keeping ATVs off the Confederation Trail. Debate was adjourned by the Honourable Member of New Haven, Rocky Point. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. May I take a moment just to recognize a couple of folks in the gallery? Uh, I'd like to welcome a very pleasantly full gallery to the debate on uh, whether or not ATV should be granted access to the Confederation Trail. Thank you all for being here today. I want to especially make note of a couple of folks at the far end of the front row, Bryson Guptill and his partner Sue. It's so nice to see you both here today, Bryson is um, the driving force behind uh, the island walk and has done an awful lot of work to uh, both maintain and improve the trail system here on Prince Edward Island. I'd also like to welcome my friend Bethany Collicut McNabb who is here again today. Lovely to see you Bethany. Last week when we uh, started debate on this motion we didn't have very much time and I decided that I would read part of a press release that was uh, given out by the Executive Director of Island Trails, Tracy Gairns Briu. And Tracy, I'm proud to say, is a, a constituent of mine um, in District 17. And I, the first part of the letter sort of outlines the history of how the Confederation Trail went from being a railway line, which was abandoned by CNR in 1989, to its current condition, which is uh, uh, an almost unique trail on, on, uh, in Canada which connects virtually tip to tip of our entire province. I also spoke a little bit about some of the individuals who were instrumental in doing the work required to secure the trail. Not a small piece of work, my goodness. We've, for those of us, and I imagine everybody in this house virtually has traveled at least a certain amount on the Confederation Trail. It crosses roads Frequently, it uh, goes through, obviously, a, a, a lot of agricultural land. And securing the rights and, the, and, and all of the work that went into giving us this absolute gem that we have uh, is something that needs to be saluted. And I talked about some of the people who managed to do that work many decades ago. I just got to the point where the trail was granted a million dollar gift from the, the Weston Fed, um, Foundation in 2014. And that, that was money which was used to complete one of the, uh, one of the um, arms, a spur off the main line. And it, it finally moved the trail from being the 273 kilometers, which is the main spine, to its current 450, uh, including all of the spurs. And that million dollar gift from the Weston Foundation came with some strings attached. They wanted an assurance that the trail would remain a greenway into perpetuity. A greenway is a space where non-motorized vehicles only and pedestrians are allowed on. And because of that, subsequently, the government passed the Trails Act and the Trails Act regulations which stipulate that the Confederation Trail is indeed a greenway supports cycling and walking, but forbids the use of motorized vehicles such as dirt bikes and ATVs. That's a piece of legislation that we have on the books here on Prince Edward Island. Again, I'm going to read from the press release of a couple of weeks ago from Island Trails. PEI was the first province to have its entire Trans-Canada Trail designated as a greenway. And we are the greenway standard that the TCT, Trans-Canada Trail, is now promoting throughout it's 24,000 kilometer trail network. For those who aren't familiar with the Trans-Canada Trail, it's an astonishing piece of work which uh, connects us. We're a large, disparate, um, geographically very diverse country. And the Trans-Canada Trail is an extraordinary piece of work to connect people from Newfoundland to the Northwest Territories and everywhere in between. And we are the place which is considered to be the gold standard of how we should design, maintain, and monitor and control what we do on that trail. The PEI ATV Federation states that many provinces are successfully sharing the trails, and that just simply is not true. 
At an October 2023 meeting of the International Appalachian Trail in Fredericton, New Brunswick, delegates heard that shared use trails in New Brunswick are becoming exclusive use ATV trails. Cyclists and walkers find shared use trails are simply not safe. And this is leading to hiking and cycling groups to build new trails dedicated solely to non-motorized use. These are trails which were mixed use trails and now walkers and cyclists are abandoning them because they're just not safe. Yesterday, I don't know if anybody heard the Mar Noon phone-in, which was on this topic. And there were even ATV owners and riders from New Brunswick and Nova Scotia calling in to say that uh, we on PEI should not allow this to happen because, um, and their, their word, hooligans have taken over the trails in their provinces. In Nova Scotia, the same thing is happening. In a document titled The Myths and Facts About Shared Use Trails in Nova Scotia, Nova Scotians Promoting Active Transportation on Community Trails, that group states, and I quote, studies clearly indicate that off-highway vehicles displace physically active users from trails. A study conducted at Acadia University, also in Nova Scotia, concluded that displacement of walkers and cyclists occurs when there is an what's called asymmetrical conflict between the user groups. When their safety is at stake, pedestrians and cyclists simply abandon shared use trails. This is also going to happen on PEI if ATVs are given access to our precious Confederation Trail. Island Trails raised all these issues with the government of PEI in 2019. This is not the first time we've had this discussion. And at that time, the ATV Federation assured the government that they only wanted to cross the Confederation Trail, not run their machines up and down the trail itself. They are now saying, however, that they need to use the Confederation Trail to connect to other trail segments at what they call pinch points in the island. So in 2019, Deborah Apps, who was the president of the Trans-Canada Trail at the time, wrote to Premier Dennis King asking for an assurance that the Confederation Trail would remain a greenway into the future, as the act that I cited earlier stipulates. And the Premier wrote back on, the Oct on October the 23rd, 2019, stating this, I quote, this government has the full intention of honouring the Greenway designation of the Confederation Trail. That's a pretty unambiguous statement, and I thank the Premier for that. I wish, he, I wish he would reiterate that, because there are many islanders who are looking for a similarly clear statement, but unfortunately we've had <coughs> crickets from the Premier. For 30 successive years, 30 years, successive PEI governments have recognised the Confederation Trail as a greenway that needs protection. Once again, Island Trails is asking the Premier for assurances that the trail will remain a greenway for the benefit of, t of today and future generations of Islanders. And that's uh, the end of the press release from Tracy Gerns Briou, the Executive Director of Island Trails. Now, I tabled that document earlier today. And I think the wonderful historical context reading right, right up to today and what the Premier said just a couple of years ago is really important in informing the discussion that we're having in the House today. This is a really hot topic right now. Um, I don't know about the inboxes of other members of the <laughs> legislature here, but mine is daily crammed with emails. All, I think almost without exception, perhaps in my case without exception, people who are expressing concerns about the idea that the Confederation Trail be opened up to motorized vehicles, specifically ATVs. There's a petition on the go right now which has well over 3,000 signatures. And Islanders love the Confederation Trails. It's absolutely clear. Some of the letters are very poignant, very, very beautifully and eloquently worded. And they all point to the same thing. The, the essence of these emails is that they care about the Confederation Trail and they care about keeping it safe and quiet and, and, and available to all islanders. The Confederation Trail quite literally connects us all. It is this trail unique in Canada, which, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, basically covers the entire island. And the, I, I've never been on the trail and not met other people, people who are 
enjoying the facility, willing to stop and talk and have a chat. Um, and it's the serenity and the peace of the place which allows that to happen. And two years ago, my wife and I, uh, and this was in mid-COVID, set off on a, uh, our very sort of not state-of-the-art bikes um, to cycle the Confederation Trail. We only had a couple of days to do this. And given our sort of advanced age, our lack of preparation <laughs> and general fitness, we knew we wouldn't make it all the way in two days. You've got to be pretty super fit to do that. Um, and we made it halfway. We made it from Tignish to Emerald, which is almost exactly halfway along the trail. Not bad for two old farts to get to basically 200 kilometers or 100 and something kilometers along, along the trail. And I carry really fond memories of those two days, and perhaps not so much, particularly the latter part of the second day. Anyway, it was um, you know mile after mile of uh, of you know, somewhat sweaty serenity. Um, through some of the most beautiful uh, parts of our island, and it's just gorgeous island scenery everywhere you turn. And it's a real joy to ride. It's a joy because it's well maintained, because it's safe, because it's peaceful, because it's beautiful, and again, because of our condition and the state of our bikes, because it's delightfully flat. Um, now, I can understand why the rail bed, and of course it got off to a very rough start, basically um, ended up bankrupting our province when it was built, um, that it's now considered to be this precious gem that anchors the growing and super successful cycling and walking destination that is PEI, because it is so well maintained. And kudos to this government and those that preceded it to have the vision and the foresight to recognize what an incredible asset the Confederation Trail could be. When it was secured back in the 90s, uh, I think it was one of, the most, uh, one of the most insightful and delightful decisions and, and things that was done here on this island. And it's left us with a very beautiful legacy, one that we must not forego. In April of 2022, this legislature passed a motion put forward by the Green Caucus at the time called a motion to establish Prince Edward Island as a cycling destination, and it urged government to expand and accelerate infrastructure investments to create a really comprehensive bicycle path system from tip to tip. And it's really critical to point out when I talk about the enhancement of uh, what are really, in some respects, tourist draws, and I have to again give en enormous credit to Bryson Guptill for his vision in creating the island walk, the Camino de, de, Is de Is Isla, uh, de Is Isla, sorry. Um, and what that has done to boost uh, tourism here on Prince Edward Island, and the Confederation Trail is also, of course, um, a, similarly a tourism attraction for so many people. And every time we enhance our province as a place for people to come and who are looking for clean and safe and attractive uh, places to visit. We also, of course, create a place for those who are lucky enough to call Prince Edward Island home that we can too use. Um, and it's, it, it benefits our population enormously. And increasingly, that traveling public, the tourism uh, folks, are, are looking for an interesting, a unique, a safe, a clean, a healthy destination in which to enjoy their vacation and bring their families. And experiential tourism is something identified by experts around the world and indeed by the Tourism Industry Association of Prince Edward Island as a growing market sector and a huge opportunity for Prince Edward Island. It's clear that uh, regular physical activity is both, of course, it's important for us physically, but it's also important for our mental health and well-being. And when we build infrastructure that's bike friendly, it's also inevitably pedestrian friendly. And whether those trails are through a forest or an active transportation lane in one of our cities, and we're continuing to expand that and connect various parts, is wonderful. Every time people get out of their cars and onto a bike or skateboard or rollerblades or put on their sneakers or their walking boots, they're making healthy choices, which are obviously good for them personally, better in the long term for our health system, and even longer term, ultimately, for the bottom line of our provincial budget. Tourism PEI is solidly behind this idea. 
from their PEI tourism strategy of 22-23. I'm going to quote, PEI has recently garnered the attention for its walking and biking trails. In some circles, PEI's island walk is being compared to the Camino de Santiago in Spain, a UN World Heritage Site known for its established network of trails and operators that facilitate related visitor experiences. Tourism PEI, of course, is not only interested in the facility itself, but in the economic spin-offs that come from that. And it goes on to say, while PEI's walking and biking trails are not yet as established as the Camino de Santiago, and we probably will never get there, thousands and thousands of people flock there, but my goodness, the numbers have just shot up here on the island walk over the last few years, so maybe we will. Maybe we'll eclipse the Camino de Santiago. Wouldn't that be awesome? But there's a real opportunity, again, from tourism PEI, to develop a strong and unique product in a similar manner. We need to work with key walking and bike trail organizers to develop and execute a holistic walking and biking trail strategy and plan with the outcome of an increased number of visitors whose main activity is experiencing walking and or biking trails with the additional revenue from longer haul travelers. Longer haul travelers are people who stay for an extended period of time with significant 30 plus night stays. Unlike many folks who will come here just for a weekend, for example, uh, people who come to enjoy our active transportation links, including the Confederation Trail and our walking trails, tend to stay for a much longer time. They have a much, relatively speaking, a much larger impact on our provincial economy here in all kinds of positive ways. So whether it's um, an environmental, a health, or an economic argument, the benefits of keeping our precious Confederation Trail non-motorized are crystal clear. Many enthusiastic and eloquent articles on how attractive Prince Edward Island is for folks looking for a unique experience that is built on our, on our existing peace and serenity exist. The Globe and Mail, the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, Forbes Magazine, Maclean's, they all have extensive articles celebrating our trail system, uh, our trail system generally and the Confederation Trail specifically. And the title of the Forbes magazine article, for example, is Cycling Through a Bucolic Paradise on Prince Edward Island. I don't think the heading of the article will be quite the same if there were ATVs competing for that space. I can guarantee you that there would be very different pieces written if we lose this trail. I look forward to hearing other members' thoughts on this important issue and hot topic amongst islanders. <laughs> and to getting this motion to a vote this afternoon. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party to second the motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise and, and speak to this motion. Every once in a while, there's an issue that strikes islanders either really the right way or really the wrong way, and we know it, as was mentioned, because our, our, mail, our email, email Oh my gosh, our emails, sorry, I have to say our email boxes. Our emails are full of emails from people. And I can tell you that I have not received one single email from anyone saying that having ATVs on our, the Confederation Trail is a good idea. And so I, of course, stand in, in support of this motion. And it is absolutely a provincial treasure that we have here. Um, and as I consider, um, the fact that one of the things that we've talked about in here a lot and one of the things that so many community organizations are fighting hard for is preventative care. And I think our trails, I find as our population grows, I get more and more um, defensive of our green spaces and our trails because I don't think that we recognize the, the gem that we have in those because people need spaces to get out and if we don't, if we don't, aren't conscious about the spaces we keep for people to enjoy quiet peacefulness, then we've missed the mark. And so as we consider health care, we consider the, the ripple effects of keeping a, a trail where people can get out and move and enjoy the benefits of physical health, um, you know, that, that just has ripple effects to, to everything. Um, so as was mentioned too, what a 
the fact, how many jurisdictions can say they have an active transportation trail that connects one end of their province or jurisdiction to the other? I think that is really cool. And if you take a minute to sit and think about that, why would we ever want to mess with that? We talk, and one of our goals in here is to uh, grow active transportation lanes and to make sure they're connected. Well, there's one massive one right there that we just, we can, we can build off, which we are building off. Um, so, and you know, the unique tourism opportunity that, that this presents and the fact that we see bed and breakfasts and restaurants reaping the benefits of, of the, the island walk and, and people who are cycling and biking on this all of the time. So to allow ATVs access would go against the whole original intention of this and it would also go against the trail strategy being developed by Tourism PEI. And really and truly, it is not fair to say that ATVs can share the trail with active transportation users. One has a very clear advantage, one little mistake, and they can take lives. So I, it, it's, it doesn't make sense that we would allow ATVs on a trail that is to be used by for active transportation. And one of the issues I'll mention, that I, I'm very conscious of the time, and I want to make sure others get a chance to speak to this, is I heard a lot of issues with the survey, which I did present to the minister. Um, a lot of people were upset that there, weren't, uh, there wasn't an option to say how they would like to use the trail in the wintertime. And why aren't we opening that conversation as well, which I think is, is a really, really important part there. And so I guess I'll close by saying, you know, I am no math expert, but I can tell you this. Walking and or cycling plus ATVs does not equal safe quiet peacefulness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kensington Malpeck. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I will be quick. Uh, thank you, Honourable Members, for bringing this motion forward. Uh, myself, I guess, as a former ATVer, um, has known this has been a topic of discussion for a while. Um, I have no interest in seeing ATVs have access to the Confederation Trail as an active ATV -er. Um But I do feel that uh, the problem's not going to go away and uh, we need to work with the ATV Federation to make sure there is an active trail for them outside of the Confederation Trail. And they've done a tremendous job uh, on doing that and uh, I think government needs to continue, uh, continue uh, working with the ATV Federation to make sure uh, that does keep going and, and there's a place for, for the ATVs, but uh, the Confederation Trail is, is not the place for it. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would like to make a, a, an amendment uh, to the motion, if I could. Um, I move second by the Honourable Member from Surrey Elmire the following amendments that the following whereas clause be added after six whereas clause and whereas there is an ongoing consultation process currently happening with the public and stakeholders which concludes Friday December 1st 2023 and that the final operative clause be amended by adding the word full after the word grant and the deletion of the words any part and already so that the clause reads and therefore, it be further resolved that the legislature urge government not to grant full access to the Confederation Trail and for all train vehicles other than, a de other than designated crossing points. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Do you have copies of your amendment, Honorable Member? I believe so, yes. Okay. Members, I'll just give you a minute here to read the amendment, and then uh, if there's anyone who'd like to speak to the amendment, I'll take a, a list of that.
There has been a motion to uh, call the vote. Honorable member from New Haven Rocky Point. I'd just like to, speak to the amendment briefly, please, sure. Madam Speaker. Absolutely. New Haven Rocky Point. <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate the comments of the member and also the, what I consider to be a friendly amendment coming forward here. Uh, I also understand that um, it's important that we continue to have dialogue with the ATV Federation here on Prince Edward Island. And currently there are a number of crossing points on the trail, as there are. I mean, you can't go on the Confederation Trail without crossing a main road. It crosses the Trans-Canada Highway, for goodness sake. And of course, there are tractor crossings all over the place. And, and there currently exists some ATV crossings. That's very different from ATVs driving along the trail bed. And the, I, I'm just going to read the, the, oper, the operative clause at the end once more, just so it's very clear. And therefore, be it further resolved that this legislature urge government not to grant full access to the Confederation Trail for all-terrain vehicles other than at designated crossing points. Um, I uh, understand from that that we are leaving the door open to create perhaps some new, different, more crossing points on the trail. And I think the users of the trail would find that probably acceptable in a way that they would find ATVs on the trail itself completely unacceptable. So I appreciate the, the willingness of the member to bring forward this, uh, this amendment, and I will support it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Anyone else to speak to the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment, signify by saying yay. Yay. Contrary, nay. The amendment has carried. Back to the motion. Uh, we have the Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty to speak to the motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, it's a pleasure to rise. It's, it's um, you know, in, in the growing, in today's, Today's age, we have a lot of issues on the uh, for PEI. I didn't expect to be uh, up here talking about ATVs on Confederation trails. Um, I don't know, really understand, uh, you know, where this came from. I mean, I I, I understand bo both sides of the argument, but really, <laughs> we have to protect the Confederation Trail and the and what it was set out to do. Um, you know, I, I too want to. Say, uh, say hello to our, our, our guests in the audience that have done an incredible job. And I've talked about that extensively, that trail in Prince Edward Island. That, in the next 50 years, will still be there. We have a trail that goes from one tip to the, to the next, to the, to the other tip of our island. That's incredible. Um, and people will know about that, and they will come. Uh, I've heard arguments, too, about, about tourism and, and, and uh, for ATVs coming in. They don't, they don't need to be on our trail. Like, they... they it, it just doesn't need to happen. It doesn't mix. When I think about people who use the trail in groups, if people run out in groups and they do different sections, like the UPI athletes, the Holland College athletes go on the trails in September. Are they going to, what happens if they were to, to have an ATV or pull up beside them in a group of 20 people on the trail? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so I, 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 um, I, I look at this and say it, it is a safety issue. Crossing's okay. Um, you know, but that has to be that has to be talked about with communities, and I think it will be. And and I mean, it's 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 up to the communities, I, I guess. And I, I've heard the same thing in my in my community. I've heard people looking and and, and grabbing onto this trail as a as a as a, a point of pride for PEI. It's it's a it's a national park that basically runs across our province, and we have to start to, to think about it that way. And I, I like that we're debating it in here now. But it also shows that we, I've been talking about this for four years, we need to get more people active. We need to get more people on the trail. That's what the motion should have said. And I mean, it's, it's for here for a reason. But we have to promote this trail. We have to get people on it. When I look through the, the Minister of Health's mandate letter, and there's nothing in here, there's nothing in there about wellness. There's nothing in there about activity. Um, we're fighting. We're fighting against wellness. The Minister of Health and Wellness should be, should be able to look at that and say, hey, you know what? The Confederation Trail is like a playground for adults. It's like it's, we need to be using it. We need to get out there and see what different sections um, we can discover and explore peacefully, quietly, and safely at the same time. And those are the type of motions, and we've talked about it with the Minister of Action. 
over there. We, we've talked about how do we get more active transportation trails, but also people using them. And that's up to government that, to promote that. And when we don't have a wellness plan, when we don't have anything in the Minister of Health and Wellness's mandate letter around activity, that's a problem. And I will be, I'll be encouraging you um, to do that. And I'm encouraging all members to vote um, for this motion, as I will be too, because the people have spoken to me and, and I'm in support of wellness, I'm in support of safety, I'm in support of, um, of, of getting out there and getting moving. And that really is what this is about. And, and whoever designed this trail des deserves a, a big thank you. And whoever designed the trail around Prince Edward Island, same thing. Let's get out and use it. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, very happy to, uh, to rise to speak to this motion. Um, I spoke to the member from New Haven, New Haven Rocky Point last week, and I said, are you going to get a chance to bring that motion back because I really want to speak to it? And um, it's interesting when you're in this line of work, uh, you work on a lot of really important files that affect the lives of Prince Edward Islanders. And I'm not trying to take anything away from this issue. It, it is very important, but it's always surprising what strikes a chord with the public. And, um, and when they decide to jump on an issue, how, um, how apparent it becomes, how important it is. And I've received more emails about this than any single uh, issue in my, whatever it is, seven months now in this job. So. Um, I've responded to every one of them, well, almost. I think I've received a couple today that I haven't yet had the, the chance to respond to yet. And I've been consistent in my message. I'm going to try to be very succinct here and definitive. I do not support allowing access to ATVs on the Confederation Trail full stop. And that's what I've told everyone. Um, I, and the member from New Haven Rocky Point read from a letter that was sent to uh, Trans Canada Trail, who are a very important collaborator on our Confederation Trail, and an investor, in fact. Uh, he read the first line of that, and I'll read that first line, but again, there's a second line that's also important. He said at the time, uh, please be assured this government has the full intention of honoring the Greenway designation of the Confederation Trail, which was originally agreed to with your organization. We recognize the importance of a non-motorized trail system as we cont continue to develop the Confederation Trail. And important there at the end where it says continue to develop. Uh, because um, I'm a trail user myself. I've used, uh, I've biked tip to tip, I've biked sections of it many times, it's, it's where I head to when I want to uh, get out on my bike and put on some miles. Um, but it, it, as we continue to develop it, that struck a chord with me because it has, still has so much more potential. Um, a, as much as we've you know, continued to develop it, it still has so much more and it's a very unique uh, resource to this province and uh, we need to protect it and continue to realize uh, the full potential of that, of that resource. And as I said, I've biked it tip to tip. And in fact, uh, when I did that in 2015, the member from New Haven Rocky Point actually joined me for a section of, of my tip to tip ride from Morrell to St. Peter's. That way, I think you turned around halfway because you uh, were the new leader of, this par of the party and had to get back to work. <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and at the time, in fact, it was, I was biking it as a fundraiser for the United Way and uh, uh, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty was also involved. Uh, we were both involved with the United Way at that time and I've got promotional photos of, uh, of us, of us uh, on the trail at that time as well. So we've all got a connection. We've all got an appreciation for it. I want everyone who's contacted me about this to know uh, uh, how I feel and have my uh, feelings on the record. And essentially, I don't know where this issue, how this issue bubbled up to become as, uh, as prominent as it has, because I, all my discussions with my colleagues on this side, I have not discovered any uh, great willingness to, to, to change anything with respect to the trail. So uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I will be brief. I know every time I say I will be brief, I always get frowns from ones on uh, my side of the house that, uh-oh, this is going to be trouble. But uh, I will be brief. I certainly do want to see it get to a motion and to a vote here today. want to uh, thank uh, certainly the mover and the seconder of this motion. Also, uh, my colleague from Kensington Malpec for bringing forward uh, the amendment to the motion. 
Uh, I certainly I'd like to recognize ones that are here in the gallery, uh, uh, all of you, but certainly ones that are here from Highland Trails. Give a shout out to my friend Greg McKee. Uh, Greg and I go back a number of years uh, back up on the Larry and uh, just for the record, thank Greg for your great work too on the Forest View Trail. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think one of the things that we've heard uh, and that's important to me that was brought forward here in uh, the amendment to the motion is the part whereas there's an ongoing consultation process. And I think that's very important to recognize that ongoing consultation process. And also the comment, and I do appreciate the conversation that the seconder of the motion had with me here uh, a while back with regard to uh, winter access, things along that line. And I think uh, that this consultation process, to me, it's never a bad thing to go out to hear feedback, to hear uh, opinions from islanders. But with that, that gave people the opportunity. And also in the survey, which over 3,500 have replied to at this point in time, there was also the means of providing additional feedback through an email, which I had shared with you. So certainly I would encourage ones uh, too, that if they feel that there's additional things that they want to put forward, that they make utilization of that email. But uh, with that, uh, I also see this as a way to increasing the potential, as my colleague uh, has mentioned, uh, the potential for use of the trail and of active transportation uh, uh, networks right across uh, this great province of ours. Uh, but with that, uh, again, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I will be supporting the amended motion. The Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm not going to take much time here. I just wanted to rise and thank the Honourable Members for bringing this forward. Uh, like I'm sure every other colleague, my email was flooded. I have a different minority in Summerside where there's a lot of people who are involved with the ATV, but uh, I keep going back and refreshing because I kept a running tally because my vote is for how my constituents want to vote. and. It was pretty close, but uh, we did have a lot of people that came forward and wanted to keep the trails the way they were. And I do agree with the honorable member from Kensington Malpec with saying that as government, we got to work to connect the trails that are there, just not on the Confederation Trail. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The yeah, honorable member from Charlottetown, Winslow, the government whip. Hey, Madam Speaker, I'll be very brief. Um, I do want to thank the uh, mover and the seconder for bringing this forward. And again, uh, just to reiterate what has already been said, that uh, you know a lot of people have reached out. So I do want to thank everybody that has reached out, and I do want to thank everybody that has taken the time. The minister, uh, the minister mentioned there's 3,500 people that have responded. I do want to thank everyone because that was my uh, message. And I do want to say that I'll be supporting this as well. I'm an urban MLA, so a lot of uh, my constituents have asked about, you know, they, I think they had the fear of the ATVs being on the trails in and around Charlottetown, which will never happen, ever. Um, and I live on Trailview Drive, so I am 100% in favor of this trail. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Very brief. Um, I just want to get up and speak to um, this. I, I want um, everyone that I've talked to and who I represent to know that I see it for the natural asset it is and that it should be protected. Um, and I'm glad that this aligns with a lot of the constituents I'm hearing from and a lot of islanders that I'm hearing from um, are telling me the same thing. I just wanted to rise to add just a technical piece and that piece being I would encourage that any crossings that are looked at are done at a 90 degree angle or thereabouts um, to avoid jogs. Um, so I would just look to those responsible in the future to um, try to do that and avoid jogs um, when designing those future crossings. Thank you. The yeah, Honourable Member from O'Leary and Vernes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I wanted to get up and speak to this motion as a, I was a former minister responsible actually for the Confederation Trail, and actually I think it was the minister that signed uh, with the Galen Weston Foundation an agreement to uh, maintain uh, the Confederation Trail as a, as a greenway for at least that section anyway, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. But the Confederation Trail is in my right, and it's very easy for a lot of these urban uh, members to get up. Now, in my particular right, I, I probably would have overwhelming support for people that are ATVers that would want to be on the trail. But I've been very consistent in my message to those uh, in every place I go. And uh, I try to say that, look, 
the ATVs, they're a reality out there, they're on the trail, but I do not think they are conducive to a Confederation trail. You can't have cyclists and walkers, uh, and these ATVs have gotten quite a bit bigger, faster and stronger and all those things uh, moving forward. So, so, uh, so I know some members said, where did this issue come from? Well, I can tell you where it came from, Madam Speaker. It came from an election campaign recently. And I remember all the candidates were eventually invited out to the ATV club in the member from Aldrin Bloomfield's riding. And I went to that particular, I went one night, and, and it, it, they had a lot of stuff there and a lot of ATVs. Um, but when the candidate for the Conservative candidate happened to go out there, he came with the Premier. And they rode in on their ATV. And, although I, I can't say I know exactly what was said because I was not there. But they certainly gave an indication that they were going to review this Confederation trail issue. I think this is where it's all come from. And I have to admit, they seem to have a lot of that candidate signs up <laughs> in the, after that particular meeting. Uh, I don't think I did very well in, in the ATV group in general terms. But, but I do want to commend Greg McKee. I've uh, known Greg a long time the service center in O'Leary, and he was also, uh, when I was uh, uh, minister, he was also involved with the Confederation Trail. Uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, Wayne McPhee and Mark Locker that maintain the Confederation Trail in my area. Um, but I do think it's really important that we do try to work with the ATV Federation to try to deal with their one big issue. In my district, they have lots of their trails all through the through the area. I think we need to convert a few more uh, abandoned roads over to the ATV group, but it's to deal with the issue at Portage. And I remember asking the Minister of uh, uh, Tourism and uh, Fisheries about that particular issue, and I think there is an issue at Portage, and it comes with route two. That route, that road needs to be a bit wider. I would like to see maybe a third lane go through there. The Minister of Transportation, half it's in his riding. Uh, I would think that if we uh, did that and then added and a little bit of a, a section for ATV use to link from Bay Road to uh, Percival Road, I think you would solve a lot of this problem. And then Going I think, by Victoria Road, right? Yeah, well, you don't want to go down that road. It's a bit of a dark hole, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no light at the end of that road, I can tell you, Madam Speaker. But, you wouldn't but, want to go down that road. No, that's not my district. I, I was happy to see that go over to the member from Aldrin Bloomfield. But, but anyway, so that's ultimately what I think uh, really has to happen. And I do encourage government to work with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just feel that it is, a, it is a unique situation. I know politically it's always difficult taking something or trying to share something with somebody else. I don't think that works. So that my advice as a legislator for government to maintain the Confederation Trail as it is for uh, non-motorized vehicles, for the exception of the time it leases it out to the Snowmobile Association. And uh, I think it is a gem. I was honored to uh, be the, the minister responsible for the trail and try to improve and add sections to the trail. I think the section out around your district, Madam Speaker, was uh, during my time. And uh, I think it is an asset, and I'll be certainly supporting this motion wholeheartedly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there anyone else to speak to the motion? I'll go to the Honourable Member from New Haven Rocky Point to close debate. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and thank you to everybody in the House. So many people spoke to this motion, and that's always lovely when you get a diversity of voices, and I appreciate each and every one of your comments. When you used to come to Prince Edward Island, you get the ferry in, and that was a sort of enforced slowdown for those of us who weren't born and bred here. Um, from the frantic world that we used to live in to a place where things are a little calmer and quieter and slower. And that charming essence of our island has not been lost, even though we have the link now, of course. Um, we're still, in some respects, the gentle island. And in a world when I think more and more folks are questioning whether faster and bigger and newer are what we should be looking for to find contentment, um, PEI still sort of stubbornly holds on to that uh, time and place when things were, were simpler and quieter. And I, I like that. Let's keep it that way. Just to finish off the thing on the cycle ride that Anne and I did, you know, we haven't finished that trip. That was two years ago. But we're going to do it. And uh, I hope that when we do, the only things that we get buzzed by are the odd mosquito or bumblebee. Uh, Madam Speaker, I now call the question. I request a standing vote. Thank you. Of members, the question has been called, and the member has requested standing division. So, if uh, the deputy um, sergeant at arms could ring the bell.
to the vote. Speaker, government's ready for the vote. Honorable members, all of those voting against the motion, please stand. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. All those supporting the motion, please stand. The Honorable Minister of Finance, the Honorable Premier, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Honorable Member from Kensington Malpec, the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honorable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Honorable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, the Honorable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Honorable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honorable Member from Summerside Wilmot, the Honorable Member from Rustico Emerald, the Honorable Member from Surrey Elmira, the Honorable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, the Honorable Member from O'Leary Inverness, the Honorable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, and the Honorable Member from Morel Dona. Honorable Members, the motion has passed. Government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Premier that the first order of the day be now read. Chair Carey. Carey. Order number one, consideration of capital estimates and committee. Honorable Member. Speaker, I move seconded by the Premier that this House now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Well, Carey. Honorable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole.
the House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall it carry? Take that. Uh, Jordan, could you uh, introduce yourself again for answers? Jordan McNally, Executive Director of Fiscal Management. Welcome back. Minister, do you have anything to table? Yep, we have an answer to a question on the emergency shelter at Park Street um, compared to the budget allocated for the emergency shelter in Summerside. All right. Our members, we're currently on page 27 uh, debating the capital budget for justice and public safety. I have read equipment and other capital assets. Uh, Shall the section carry? Sure. Vehicles, appropriations provided for vehicle purchases. Vehicles, 55,000. Total vehicles, 55,000. Shall it carry? Sure. Uh, Cheryl Dan West Rosie. Anything that you can on that line, um, 55,000. Sure. Is, yeah. yeah, that's for uh, fire marshal's office. So they added a position last year. Typically takes roughly a year to train them while uh, working under existing uh, fire inspectors. So the current year budget of 55 is for that position that was added last year. They also got approval in current year budget for another fire inspector, uh, basically to build their capacity. So the, the vehicle next year is for when that new position requires a vehicle. So two vehicles total. Shall I So, so th this is under vehicles, so that's for a vehicle or a position? A vehicle, it's for new positions that were added over the last two years to that uh, fire marshal's office. So they are for, for vehicles. Yeah. Shall it carry? Total capital expenditure justice and public safety, 4,936,300. Shall it carry? Capital expenditure, social development and seniors, capital improvements, buildings, appropriations provided for capital improvements and construction, construction renovations, 2 million. Total capital improvements, buildings, 2 million. Uh, Charlton and West Royalty? Yeah, so capital improvement buildings, um, we're only, well, we're forecasting, I guess, uh, 3.4 this coming year. Can you talk about what that's for? Yeah, so the plan for the department is to purchase um, six five-bedroom homes over the next five years. Um, the current forecast in current year is to purchase three of them. Um, I know they're actively looking for um, existing properties that uh, obviously there's some criteria that they would have to check off for it to be suitable, um, but it would be to, to purchase existing uh, five bedroom homes and if there was renovations needed, it would be part of that as well. Cheryl, do you have yeah, and is that because we changed the legislation? Were they foreseeing that we needed more space for people, for kids aging out of care? That would be, um, that wouldn't be in the, the these next two years. It's a different project there, aging out of care. Yeah. That project starts um, really in 26, 27, but, <coughs> but that project is as a result of the change in legislation, yeah. Okay. Sure, I'll what's your okay. Yeah, and I, I see, so, it, it, and here it says 30 beds, $6.1 million, so we're kind of cutting half of that, looking for three, three, uh, three houses this year. Um, so are we talking about room for 15 people? Is that our goal? That would be the goal, yeah, exactly. And, sure, and, sure and that's based on a need in the system uh, currently, correct? Yeah, they, they have pretty high occupancy rates in their existing homes. Uh, I know they just are about to open. I believe they're just recruiting for a new home in New Annan um, that was purchased in 22-23 or, or uh, early 23-24. And, yeah, so it, it would be to address needs and to reduce the occupancy rate uh, down from where it is. Yeah. That's it for me for right there. Yeah. Lead of third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the... The six new group homes over the next four years, did, I, I might have missed this in the very beginning of his questions, but I'm wondering, is there any projected to be ready for 23-24? They wouldn't be ready. Right right now they're forecasting, um, their, their plan is to hopefully purchase three homes in the current year of the, of the six that are in the five-year plan. 
Um, it would take some time to actually, depending on which home they purchase, there's some renovations potentially involved, and then they would need to recruit staff to those homes as well. So there is a bit of time of implementation. For example, the new Annan home that was purchased in 20, late 22-23, and um, th they're just finalizing operationalizing that home, I believe. They're recruiting staff now, so there is a, a bit of a, a, a lapse between when they're actually purchased and when they're operational. So, yeah. Lead to third party. Thank you, Chair. And I'm wondering, so the, the purpose-built facility for high-risk needs youth, I know we have um, the information in front of us. Do you have any information on that that we don't have? Uh, no, I, I believe uh, there yeah, really the information you have is, is uh, what I have as well. I know in terms of timing of that, um, there's 50K allocated this year, uh, 200 next year, which would be for design of, of the actual building, and then the construction would be planned for uh, 25, 26 of that facility. Leave the third party. And how many, how many beds does, do you know how many beds that will give us? No, they don't have that level of detail determined at this point. Um, I know they're still going out and doing assessment, which is, is noted there as well, uh, for what other jurisdictions currently have for something like this. Um, but no, I don't have a number of beds. Lee, the third party. Thank you, Chair. And, um, oh, shoot. Oh, so the $50,000 that you said was for this year, what would that be for? I don't have the level of detail of what that would be for. I know when they're talking about going out and doing jurisdictional scans, I'm not sure if that would involve a uh, consultant. Um, and if it's something that's tied to the actual project itself, it might be something that could be capitalized potentially. So that might be what it's for. You the third party? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess it, it's fair to say at this point that all of these are kind of just in the, um, the planning stages. Yes, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Okay, I'm good for the chair. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Dick. This is important because of the legislation that we were just talking. Huge, crazy, because we're going to, we're, we're timing people out at 25 now, so there'll be a, there's going to be a demand. There's one, the 10, the 10 transitional housing beds is in my district on, on Beach, the staff does an amazing job. I haven't, I haven't heard any complaints ever. Um, can't we speed this along by using the existing model and replicating that? Uh, the existing housing units, a 10 bedroom. I, I'm just looking at the timelines. We don't have time to wait for 27, 28 on that. Um, wh wh where's the initial plans for this? Where's the plans for this? Yeah, Are you where? Can it be um, used again to save time? Is that what you're saying? Use the same design over and over? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Which could save time? Exactly. It, it's it's working. I, I do believe. Like I, I'm not sure we're we're. I'm just on the floor. We're just talking. Hopefully, we're talking apples and apples. But it's it's a working model, and the, obviously the plans are in the system. I'm just looking at how we save a year on this. I, I'd just like to see this project get advanced because um, we will we will need it obviously in this. Um, can we can we look at speeding this up or do we have the land first of all for this um do we it, it, is that what the fifty thousand is for we don't know what that's for uh the 50 was for the purpose-built facility for high-risk needs the aging out of care transitional housing units um there there's no money in the current year forecast for that that's really to start in 26 27 um <sighs> And, and that's really where the project is, you know, substantially. Cheryl, can we We're gonna. I'm gonna keep these for next year. Can we start that in 25, 26 at least? I think we keep coming back to this, and I think, I think if in going through this budget process, you know, there's a ton of projects that we would love to start next year, right, or this year. It's a mat. It's a matter of trying to balance things out, right? So we, um, you know, you do have to spread some projects out but like I'll, I'll note you know I've, I've been noting what you've been yeah. putting you know a sense of urgency on mm -hmm. um, but like you know I would say if you ask government can we speed this up and do this next year I would say we would love to do that too it's it's but 
operationally, you have to manage that. Yeah. Fiscally, you have to manage that. Yeah. Cheryl, can I Cheryl? Well, I'll just put it on the record that I'm willing to go as an MLA to say that this is working in my community. Mm -hmm. We want to support. My community wants support. It's already there. The, the building's already there. It works. Yeah. Um, if that's uh, because the, 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 on the floor, when we made this, when we, when we were expanding our need, we're expanding our support. And the uh, director of child services, yes, this is going to be important. So I'm just saying I'll, I'll work with the minister, too, to see whatever we can do. If you want to look at a beach grove, I will take that back to my community. They are very supportive of, of helping out, and this is one way to help out. So I'll just, I'll just add that to see if we can speed it up a year. That would be a win for everybody and especially the kids in care. So, um, And the other thing I want to ask, just... It's, it's, I have to ask this and then um, I'll stop asking on this section afterwards if I can. Um, I just got the form that it was $1.2 million for Park Street. It came in at $2.5 million. That's, that's a $1.3 million overage. And I don't know if these are questions are out of line because of the section, but I'm asking on the, uh, so that's an enormous, that's, that's double and then some about what the project was supposed to be in at is, um, is that appropriate normally for a Minister of Finance to, to have to approve such an overage? Well, I think... Mr. do you want to... I, I can. I'll, I'll, enter, I'll entertain it. Um, um, I think, and, you know, what I said yesterday or the day before, um, we develop a plan based on what we know, right, at the time and the best data and the knowledge that we have. And I think the Minister has, has spoken about in question period how, you know, in further conversations they've identified, you know, a bit of a pivot that they might be making as far as, you know, looking for more, uh, that the need might be more in uh, transitional housing as opposed to in focusing on that as opposed to the emergency. So I think that that is just, you know, that that's what happens. But this plan was based off information. Um, he's had further conversations, and I think he's been clear in question period of, of why that is the way it is. And I'll leave it at that. Is this kind of I'm not surprised you have more questions. <laughs> yeah, not in the least. Charles and Yeah, well, I just want to say is if we're if there's a pivot to transitional housing, like I said to the minister today in question period, I expected to see that in the capital budget. It's not there. This was developed before, so there could be you know there could be money reallocated to that. I guess is what I'm saying. But Charles and Westrow. But but before it was August. The, the the Department of Housing submits a, a their their maybe in August, maybe whatever, and it's changed so much since then. Uh, I'm just trying to say where where where's the plan and, and how are we base you, you talked about fiscal prudence um, uh, the prioritization and, and mm -hmm. there's a few words that were used in there I don't see this being fiscally prudent or having a plan that we're following yeah. it, I, it is being fiscally prudent and we are this is a five-year plan once again right so it's it's allocating that money to tend to the items that are very important to you like this you want to see money in this bucket is what I'm hearing um, so you know there's money in that in that bucket and the minister and his team will identify where the needs are and spend the money where where, where it's required glad there's money in the buckets it's just not in the pages Sure. Shall the section carry? It's not in it. Equipment and other capital assets. Appropriations provided for information technology and system modernization. Child Protective Services, uh, nil. Total equipment and other capital assets. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering if you can tell us why the, the budget for Child Protection Services is cut. Um, it's not cut. The project's actually complete. So this was to um, re replace technology uh, for child protection services. The project is complete. I know they're in the testing phase of that. Um, so it's just a matter of the project being complete. Is all. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So I'm assuming if it's in the testing phase and it does need some more funding, that that will be... Yeah, that would be included in the professional service contract in terms of what do, uh, I'll call it deficiencies mean, but yeah, it would be covered in, in that, that budget line. Thank you, Chair. I'm good. Uh, shall I carry? Sure. Total capital expenditures, expenditure, social development of seniors, two million. Shall I carry? Sure. Uh, capital expenditure, transportation infrastructure, land, appropriations provided for land purchases and shoreline protection. Land purchases, 365,000. Shoreline protection, two million. Total land, two million, 365,000. 
Oh, they were in Inverness. Just, just a quick when, uh, that, that, That's not very much money for any shoreline protection. Uh, what, what's the place? Is this money that's going to be uh, matched by the federal government, maybe? Or I'm just I, anyway, it just seems like such a. I just know from West Point, it was like that was a million. So <laughs> if you're doing any amount of shoreline protection, you're, you're going to have to do a lot more than that in one year, I would think. Yeah, at this point, there's no federal dollars or matching associated with the two million. Okay, thanks. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at the uh, land purchases lines between the estimate and forecast last year, and there was an uh, there was an unplanned five million dollars spent. What was that money spent on? Yeah, really, the two components of that are. Um, the government exercised its option to purchase land. Uh, I'll call it Sisters of St. Martha land. It's 29 acres. Uh, I'll, I'll call it near UPEI, that, that location. Um, so that was an unplanned purchase. And the other one is uh, Canada Nature Fund uh, had an amendment to their agreement where um, they, they added some extra money where we could go out and purchase land and it would be funded by the federal government. Okay. New Haven, sure. Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I mean, that's great. Those are both important pieces of land that now sit under government control, and I love that. Where are we in terms of the goal of protecting 7% of uh, the island land mass by, tw uh, well, by 2020? I think I'm 2030, maybe. Minister, 2030. is that a capital budget expenditure? No. Um. So the purchase of the, that land would be in the operating budget? Be a mix of, so of for both. the protected lands. So, so I thought so, the sorry, question uh, was, where are we on the percentage? Yeah. Um, um, I, I'd have to confirm it. Okay. Um, well, but I thought the last number the I heard was 5.91. Is that is that close? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was 5.91 was the last number okay. I heard out of the seven. All right, we're coming on New Haven Rocky Point. So, is this where we would find if we if there were such a thing uh, a land bank for farmers in this section? Um, I, it's not included in no. in this okay. department as it stands now. I'm not sure where it would be included if it were to be. Okay. <coughs> Chair, you Rocky Point. Yeah, for the shoreline protection. So what's what's the overall objective of that shoreline protection program? I mean, I the, the, the name suggests it. I think the objective in that money is to basically look at critical infrastructure um, and protection of it. Um, yeah, they, they say it's really to protect provincial assets, roads, and provincially owned land uh, okay. along the shoreline. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. So what projects were completed last year and what projects are planned for this year? Um, there was... Um, there was improvement to the water bank stabilization in at Jack Cartier and Pamir Island, um, as as well as hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, West Point Gyrones project. Um, establish additional offshore reefs to mitigate the coastal erosion on West Point okay. area, um, and uh, reestablish sand dunes in the vicinity of West Point Lighthouse and Cedar Dunes Provincial Park. That would be projects that were done this year. And they work well. Yeah. New Haven Rocky Thanks, Chair. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, the, the member from O'Leary Inverness speaks frequently about how well that offshore reef is working at, at <coughs> the West Point Lighthouse. Do you have a dollar figure attached to that particular project? I'm just in my own head. would like to know how much it cost. I don't know. They just kind of list the projects that were completed within that budget allocation. But I, I don't have the details by project now. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. So we have, there's two million a year, as I see going forward. Is that, um, surprises me that over five years we're not increasing that as the need to protect our shoreline gets more acute? Why are we not increasing that? I mean, I, again, this is, you know, what was um, brought forward by the team at Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Um, I know they work closely with the UPEI um, school in St. Peter's. Um, I would expect that, you know, um, this is an informed decision, um, and this is the number they put forward. Okay. I'm good with this section. Thank you, Chair. Hello, Section Kerry. <coughs> 
capital improvements buildings appropriations provided for capital improvements and construction capital repairs six million seven hundred ninety two thousand eight hundred construction renovations four million five hundred thousand total capital improvements buildings eleven million two hundred ninety two thousand eight hundred is there any questions sure. uh Cheryl Town West Royalty yeah building ventilations and system upgrades um it seems like there's a lot in the different budgets, but here it's 23 budget is 1.2, and then the forecast is 200, or just 278,000. Then it goes up, and I see, I see in 24, 25 that'll be a building in O'Leary. But why the, why the difference between budget and forecast for 23, 24? That one is just a delay in the project, so um, really 900,000 of the. $1.2 million budget is uh, delayed and moved into 24-25 on that particular project. Sure, then what's your And that's just because of, is that because of labor or is that because of, why was because that? Because it's in my ride. <laughs> <laughs> <But anyway. laughs> is that true? <laughs> what are you doing? I need to get much traction up there. Yeah, no, there's, there's no uh, specific reason in my notes string. in terms of why that project's been delayed. Charlotte and West Royalty? And the, uh, the access PEI Cornwall furniture fittings and equipment in 24 25. Um, is, that, is that building under construction now? Yeah, I know the tender for that location has been awarded. Um, so let me see in terms of timing. Uh, most of the costs, or all of the costs, are are slated for 24, 25. So I'm thinking that uh, they're probably in the kind of design phase of what that retrofit looks like. Cheryl Town West Royalty. And for everything that was delayed, I d I don't know how we could priority. It seems like this is a priority, and the things that were delayed, I look at those as being a priority for people's housing. So I, I just I don't understand the. You know, it's it's important, and access PEI building is important, but on the scale of p people having a place to live and transitional housing that has been delayed and not in this budget, um, I just have a problem with that. So that's all I have to say, I guess, on that one. Um, and then after that, uh, oh, I will save my questions for the next section. Thank you. New Haven, Rocky Point. Chair. So there's a big increase in the capital repairs budget, and I'm just wondering what that is for. Yeah, the big, the big thing there is um, the greening and retrofit program is we'll uh, being included in there. So that's 4.9 million being added uh, to next year's budget to start that program. New Haven, Rocky Point. Jordan, can you just say uh, what? particular buildings, or is this through, I, I'm really glad, by the way, that we're working on the government-owned buildings to make them examples of, of uh, green retrofit, but which ones are we doing that on? Yeah, so for 24-25, their priority was on some social, social housing um, existing buildings. Um, the four they have identified are at 225 Linden Avenue, Summerside, 501 Queen Street in Charlottetown. Um, the uh, Route 2, 19854 Route 2 Hunter River, 14 units, and uh, 324 Church Street in Tignish. All right, thank you. Um, New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. And conversely, in the construction and renovations, there's a huge decrease in that. Why, why is that? Yeah, there's some larger completions happening in the current year. Um, the biggest of which would be the, uh, there's kind of two larger ones, Kings County Highway Depot is coming to completion. So um, because it's being complete, there's no budget needed for the remainder uh, the next year. The other large one is the West Prince Community Health Center is uh, complete. Um, so those are two large projects that no longer require funding. Okay. I'm good with this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Sure, Capital Improvements Highways, appropriations provided for highway and bridge construction. Active transportation, 1 million. Bridges, 19,350,000. National and collector highways, 20,900,000. Provincial paving, 19 million. Total capital improvements highways, 60,250,000. I'm not even going to look up. I'm sure there's no questions about this at all. <laughs> Charlton West Royalty. Just me. Um, no, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 
Active transportation, five million dollars over five years. I remember that number being higher in the past. Is that is that a are we are we looking at the next five years to reduce the amount of funding we're putting into active transportation? I think in the past it was five million per year. There was a push to do twenty-five million. I think it was five million per year, Jim. I think it was one and a half. Oh, was it one and a half? Okay. It was one and a half last year. Okay, it was one and a half then, maybe. So uh, there's been a big push on active transportation. We've been doing a lot of active transportation. I suspect um, a lot of big projects have been completed, and this is kind of a likely a new normal. Um, but again, I'd have to confirm that with the minister. Cheryl, then what's Charlie? So we were at twenty-five million over five years. No, that might be, not be. That might uh, not be correct. It sounds about right. I. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to confirm that. <laughs> I know. I, I would have to confirm that. That was in my head, but. <laughs> I rem but that, that's how I started it off. I remember this number being way higher. Mm -hmm. One million dollar doesn't build too much, uh, doesn't have too much pavement. Uh, you, can't, you can't do too much with it. So five million dollars over five years. Are we on that cycle so next year will be one million or does, is there a carryover into next year being five million dollars? How much are we allocating for next year? Yeah, it, it is a straight million per year. Um, they, they have done a lot of work with this over the past couple of years, and I, I know this would just be for collector highways, um, adding transportation or active transportation to that. I know there is, there, it's, uh, there's some different uh, allocations even in the operating budget but to allow like municipalities to, because yeah. that would be operating grants. So, mm -hmm. environment, I know they have some active transportation funds, and then Transportation and infrastructure also have the ICIP program where, as an example, um, Abiquit Connects was a project done um, in Scotchford that was all done through the ICIP program. So there, there is other allocations of active transportation that, that wouldn't fall under just collector highways, but that's what this bucket is for. Okay. Charlton, West Royalty. Well, that's good. How much more How much more of the island do we have to do then? Um, you think it's, it's all done. Are we, are we what, what are the projects for next year? What is the where is the one million dollars going for next year? Yeah, I don't have a list of the projects allocated for next year because it's tied with the collector and national highways. Um, a lot of the projects have been submitted to New Build Canada Fund and have been already established. So they kind of, as they're doing those provincial uh, or those paving projects, I think they look for opportunities where active transportation could go in, and that's where this allocation kind of comes into play. Um, so, yeah, between those, between the national and collector highways, it's really that one million is kind of added to that bucket in, in order to to add active transportation. Shelton, West Road. The national collector highways, provincial paving and bridges, that's where a chunk of that money, the $256 million, we would find for active transportation? No. Two? Yeah. No, sorry. Or you'd find some of that in there? No, there is some that they do in provincial paving. So provincial paving is basically secondary roads. Um, they, that would be if there's an opportunity to widen roads as they're going out to, to repave those secondary roads. Um, but really, the one million act of transportation in, in that budget line is really for national collector highways only. And, and provincial paving um, it is based on whether there's opportunities to widen the road as they're as they're doing the recap. Okay. Sure, road. I say okay, but I don't really know what we're talking about here. I don't know if we're getting active transportation or widening highways. So, uh, I remember I I know uh, uh, from being involved in, in the groups that apply for it. It's it's an operating budget from the Department of Environment. Is I think what you're getting at yeah. is, the, is the projects that are like much more local, the ones that yeah. you've been lobbying for, the yeah. ones that I've been lobbying for. So okay. it's a fund through the operating budget. And from what yes, I understand, right. this is it's that's oh, five yeah, million okay. a year, I think, is where okay. you're getting it from. That's the confusion. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And I know just... Well, Charlie, well, Charlie. Thank you very much. I know that, and the minister, I've had a conversation with the minister, and he's been open to talking about that. I know I have to get the municipality involved, and so I'm just making it it clear that I have to go that that route so it's it's kind of complicated but you know 
you have to, as MLAs, you have to lobby at certain times of the year, or else you lose a year. So, um, and yeah. can I add yes, that please. sometimes, uh, rather than using up the entire active transportation budget, <coughs> you lobby the Department of Transportation for what Jordan had mentioned about using some of the recap allocation budgets to do a paved shoulder or something like that mm. too, so you don't, you know, waste it all out of that five million dollars, or you work with the municipality to get shared dollars. So okay. I completely understand what you're yeah. talking about. Dude. Okay, perfect. You got to yeah. push every corner. And yeah, I know, and I thank the the chair for bringing that forward, and it's it's great. I mean, this is good money. We and then the only thing, other thing, that's not in here is just to get people using the trails, keep getting that push. But I know that's an operational. So, but thanks a lot for the chair for the intervention because I I didn't know what I was getting into there. I don't have much recap in my uh, <laughs> no, in don't. my uh, riding. So thank you. Sure, uh, Rustico Emerald. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I just, uh, in the past, I, I brought up this uh, idea of a, of a road continuum, and that's uh, where you'd start with, uh, you know, like a cow path, and then eventually you work your way up to uh, you know, a seasonal road, and then um, maybe it could say it's a, a heritage road, and then eventually you get a gravel road out of it, and then eventually it gets paved. Um, a, a lot of my requests have to do with maintenance on on gravel roads and clay roads, and I had a number of requests. I just wanted to read them into the record. Uh, Browns Road up near Stanley Bridge, um, the end of the Dixon Road down by through 225, Hazel Grove Road, um, and various places. Um, the center road, which work was done this year, the Murphy Road in Freetown, where I have a lady who's had an operation in the spring. Who couldn't get in and out after opera her support couldn't get in and out and then in and so i put it on the list and said that was the reason it had to be fixed she has another operation this fall and she still can't get in and out and so then uh, there's the clyde road frederick station road the millvale road and the, uh, the great work was done on the front road extension so I, I went back and i said you know why can't we get that maintenance done on these roads. Mostly it's gravel that's required, as well as digging out ditches and things like that. And it was budget, 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 all the way through. They said, we're out of budget. We can't fix your road this summer. Um, and we're not talking about paving here. We're talking about gravel. Now, I have talked to the minister, and the minister says that, in fact, gravel is like is like paving, you know. And when it comes to, to money, it's it all comes back down to that budget. So I wanted to find out. Um, in the capital budget, how many how many loads of gravel are you bringing? How many shipfuls of gravel are you bringing it in, and so we can get these roads improved? Um, because they're getting worse and worse every year due to the climate change and the, the warmer temperatures year round. Uh, are we are we improving and and getting more gravel in this coming year than we've had in the past? Are we increasing that? So, Minister, that's not a capital budget. That's an operating budget question, right? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So sorry, member, but that's in the annual operating budget, the allotment for gravel and side roads. So capital improvements is for the for the uh, the highways, the active bridges, national and collector uh, highways, and then the provincial paving for capital projects, not for the operational budget. Okay. All right. Uh, well, you, I want, get, I you did that, get those roads in the I record. I got that though. on the record. You did get them in the record. Uh, there is a bridge that needs to be replaced. It has had to be replaced for two years now. It's uh, off on a heritage road, and it requires it's required for farmers to get to their fields. Um, they did put a temporary bridge in so that snowmobilers could get across, but it's the Princetown Road uh, Bridge. Um, would that be covered by this budget? Yeah, that would be a, a bridge replacement would be covered by that budget. That by the capital budget, um, I don't have a detail on on what projects are planned for the next year under that that line item. But uh, based on if it was a sizable bridge to be replaced, then then uh, yeah, it would fall in this budget. All right, I'll I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Uh, leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, um, uh, active transportation. There was. Uh, four million dollars in unplanned spending and I'm just wondering if you can explain what that went towards yeah there was some projects um, as they were doing uh, new build Canada fund projects um, and, and some ICIP projects that there was opportunities to widen the collector and national highway along those those routes um, so there was a number of projects there was uh, route 13 in Mayfield Route 20 in Hamilton, 
uh, Route 16 in Red Point, and Route 16 in Chepstow. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And, and one of the things that with bridges and with provincial paving, um, it, we just have a consistent overspend on that in the province. And so last year we were, for provincial paving, $8 million was spent above budget. And so I'm wondering how confident we are, how confident you are that we're actually going to stay on budget with provincial paving this year. That was considered in the allocation for this year. Um, because there were overages. So we've upped that budget. I think it was 15 million yeah. per year. Um, and then, um, and you're right, we were, there was, you know, special warrants and different pieces every year it seemed. So what we've done is we've looked at that um, and we've raised it to 19 million now. So we have raised it a little bit to feel like, okay, now we're maybe more on target, but still keeping that fiscal lens on it as well. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so are, are, are you hopeful or confident that this new kind of bump will stop those, the process of, of just kind of adding and adding and adding? That was the consideration and that's what the line, the new line that we've adjusted that we feel is more on target to alleviate the overspend. Shall the section carry? Carry. Equipment and other capital assets. Appropriations provided for information technology, system modernization and equipment purchases. Electric vehicle charging stations, 150,000. Emergency preparedness, 4 million. IT system modernization, 644,000. Total equipment and other capital assets, 4,794,000. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, so where are the new chargers being, the EV chargers being added here? Um, apologies if there is a list somewhere in the handout. No, there there isn't a list um, that that I have in my notes. Um, <coughs> I know that this is for government-owned buildings. These EV chargers, so I think they take a look at where where they're currently EV chargers and uh, decide where where the greatest need is. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So there was some discussion about school bus drivers being able to um, have chargers in their homes. Is that any of the money being uh, devoted to that? No, that would be uh, something considered with with the Department of Education um, in terms of what their policy is around um, adding chargers at, at bus drivers' homes. Okay. Chair? New Haven Rocky Point. So I'm looking at the emergency preparedness line, and that was a new item last year for this department, uh, and obviously one that was well needed. And I'm happy to see that we have four million, but um, it doesn't look like that budgeting's going to be sustained past this year. Is that right? Next year, rather. Yeah, next year there's four million, and then a million and a half the year after. Right. Um, really, the, the largest intent with that budget line was to look at government infrastructure and and what's needed in terms of generator replacement or added as new. Um, so they put together a list, and kind of once that list is exhausted, um, that's where that funding would, would end. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. And just going back to the chargers for a minute, and it, clearly we're seeing more and more EVs on our roads. And one would think that the budget line for putting in chargers to support the larger number of cars would be increasing consequently along with that, but that's not what we see here. It's actually going down. What's the what's the rationale there? Yeah, there's a, there's a mix there. So this electronic or electric vehicle charging stations are really for government-owned properties. Um, at the Department of Environment, they, they also have a budget line to add vehicle chargers, charging stations at other locations across the province. So we've seen when we were there that over the next two years, they do have an increase in chargers going out. So that's the discrepancy. I think there's 33 chargers being added. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, Jordan. Sometimes you have to say the same thing twice for it to absorb <laughs> on this side of the house. But you did say that, and I apologize for making you say it again. Uh, I think that's all I have for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall I carry? Yeah. Vehicles. Appropriation provided for vehicle purchases. Heavy equipment, $4 million. Light fleet, $2 million. Total vehicles, $6 million. Shall I carry? 
Total capital expenditure. Oh, Trans I think Rob has one. Oh, sorry, O'Leary and Burness. My apologies. This is my big question for the whole bloody year. Here we go. Every, every, every day, every time I run down for Christmas morning and I look at it in my sock, and since these guys come in, all I get is a lump of coal. But my one question, is there a bush cutter for District 25 this time round? Because already the thing has, it's in the junk heap now. Well, this bush cutter better be a big one. So if, if you, Minister, if you can tell me there's a bush cutter coming to Larry and Vernes for uh, next time, boy, my issues are, it'll go pretty smooth from here. And if there's not, I might flip the table here. <laughs> Um, Jordan's yeah. I, I do. I did ask uh, since, uh, about about some of this information. So, You're what, I, what I can say is um, they, they do it by county um, in terms of where where the bush cutters are added. Um, all I all I know for sure is that um, two were added. There's kind of four allocated to Prince County. One <coughs> one's a contractor. Um, two were new in 2021, and one is still an older one. Um, yeah, I know what the older one is. <laughs> that, that's my district. Does anybody know where the older one is? Yeah, you just, I, I do that. So you're not telling me anything I know, but uh, but you're saying that there's a couple of them that are going to be replaced in Prince County, and I have the oldest one, so that would be a, probably a good sign. Well, there was there was two replaced in 2021, <laughs> is all I can say. Yeah. You know, the, the, the department is still looking at their priorities for 24-25, and, and they don't have a listing of specifically what's going to be replaced. But it would well, be. Larry Inverness. Well, I do know, like I, I was asking around, like a bush cutter, the system, you're probably talking about a $300,000, $350,000 expenditure. Now, you only get $4 million here and totaled into heavy equipment. So that's given me some pause for concern here. But, but I really emphasize, Minister, you know, I know the minister, uh, the minister of transportation, should provide a bit more information on this to you. But like I said, it, it my riding, it's unbelievable. The trees are up to. I showed pictures of the power lines here yet a couple of days ago, and uh, well, you can't see the flamingos. No, the uh, flamingo wouldn't even couldn't even nest in the power lines <laughs> in my district. The trees are up through it. So, so I really emphasize. I mean, I, I keep complaining about it all the time, but it's costing you money as a government. It's costing you money in water removal. Uh, you've got to get backhoes in when the snow melts quick because the, the water can't get through. You need a, you need a bush cutter. So at the one in my district at the moment is kaput. It's in the junk heap at the moment, I think as of uh, maybe about a month ago. Now, out of the graciousness, I, I would say, if the minister, he has put the one in his district into my district oh. to try to keep it going. But we're so far behind uh, that, and, and the operator says it, it, it's just, it's taken way more time and it's harder on the equipment. So it's costing you money here. You gotta, you gotta start providing some equal uh, services when it comes to one riding over the other. I keep taking it on the chin every time. <laughs> and uh, I'm sick of the lump of coal here for this Christmas. So try to get me a bush cutter, will you? <laughs> I'll make it my mission to find you a bush cutter. There we go. There we oh. go. I, I much appreciate that. <laughs> no further questions from Larry Andres' perspective. Uh, Rush to go, Emerald. So there seems to be a shortage of graders in the central Queens area. It's like clockwork. Every three weeks, I get calls from people on the roads that are at the end of the cycle that the roads need to be graded. And I've been told, yeah, we used to have another grader and we cut back, we, one died and we didn't replace it. Is there any money in this budget to buy new graders? It would be in the heavy equipment budget, um, not specifically to buy that. I don't have that level of detail. I know the department is uh, taking an inventory of what they currently have and what are the priorities of, uh, for purchase next year within that $4 million. It, it is a bump of $500,000 um, from the previous year, um, but that's that's all the information I have on that budget line. So this is my request for a new grader. Then. Thank you, Larry Amara. And uh, I don't want uh, Larry Inverness to feel like he's all alone yes. oh. in his in his quest for. Uh, we'll get you a ditch. bush cutter too. <laughs> <laughs> what was that again? We'll get you a bush cutter too. Oh, that, that's all I want to hear. <laughs> Shall the section carry? Here. Here. Total capital expenditure transportation infrastructure eighty four million seven hundred one thousand eight hundred shall carry. Thank you, members. Thank you, minister, and thank you, Jordan. Oops. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair, and the chair make report to Madam Speaker. Shall carry.
Thanks, Jordan. Actually, he's coming right back for something. Yeah. Yeah. New Gordon did good. <laughs> Is that what you call him, little, little Gordon? Madam Speaker's Chair, Committee of the Whole House, I wish to report that the committee has gone into capital supply to be granted to His Majesty and come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directing to report to the House whenever it should be pleased to receive same. So, Carrie. Carrie. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by... Uh, the Department, Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, that the report of the committee be received. So I'll carry. The Honourable Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Tell so Carrie. Carrie. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Joe. Premier. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the second order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number two, consideration of supplementary estimates in committee. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself from the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the uh, supplementary estimates for His Majesty. Shall it carry? Yeah. Honorable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole.
The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supplementary supply to His Majesty. Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall it carry? Sure. Welcome back, Jordan. Could you introduce yourself for Hansard again? Jordan McNally, Executive Director of Fiscal Management. Okay, members, uh, we are going to start on page 7, Schedule A. And I'll read the departments, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, Capital, Total, 2,974,800. Shall, uh, Leader of the Third Party. So we're not giving, given much information at all on any of these supplemental, uh, on the special warrants. So for example, we get to fund additional capital expenditures related to tourism PEI assets owned by government. Is there any way that we can get more detailed information on these? On these, um, yeah, I mean, you can ask, um, ask away. Um, I'll note that for another year, I suppose. But feel free to ask any questions, and we'll lead the third party. Thank you, Chair. I guess, I mean. The point being that's those those are you know fairly big ticket items and we don't have any additional information above and beyond that and I find that I mean we're here debating a budget but we have no idea two million nine hundred seventy four thousand eight hundred dollars we have no idea what that is not a clue you know um, so what was what are a few things that were in there yeah ask the question we'll answer yeah so in that in that particular line item the there's kind of two large pieces. Uh, there was some upgrades at the Mark Renz Park um, that they were kind of cost overruns from 22-23, so that would be uh, two million of that. Um, then there was some work done at Crowbush Golf Course as a result of Hurricane Fiona um, to enhance that shoreline, and so those are the two big pieces there. Shall I carry? Uh, leader of the Opposition. Uh, Chair, I was wondering if you could just um, give me a, a, a better understanding of what the difference is between Schedule A and Schedule B. Sure. Schedule A is special warrants for the fiscal year 22-23. So the, and the other one is 23-20. Schedule B is for the current 23-24 year. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Um, so, in under health and wellness, uh, for capital... Sorry, uh, Honourable Member, we're on economic oh. growth, tourism and culture. Oh, we're still on there. I'm sorry for that. Um, okay, well, I'll save my question for the next. Shall I carry? Yeah. Uh, health and wellness capital total. Uh, sorry, to fund additional capital expenditures related to capital projects. Total, 1760700 Leader of the Opposition. Could you please uh, give us some information on what that money was spent on? Sure, yeah. Um... There, there's kind of two pieces to it. One is the um, mental health and addictions campus. Um, changes in timing and higher costs in that, that fiscal year. Um, it was offset partially by a delay in phase two of the electronic medical record, which is what we kind of seen in the capital budget for health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are the two pieces. That's the only two? Yeah. Uh, Cheryl, I'm with Cheryl. Yeah. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. Leader of the third party first, and then no, I'll come back. No, I'm good, Chair. That was my question. Okay. Thank uh, you. Cheryl, Daniel, Cheryl. Yeah, in that year, I saw the public accounts, and they, they underspent on their capital. Health PI underspent on their capital by $10 million, but we're giving them more money and, and their operational funding, too, as well. But yet we have a $1.7 million special warrant. Yeah, this one's for the, the Department of Health and Wellness, not Health PEI. So that's, that's what that is. So if it's for the Department of Health and Wellness, but you mentioned the mental health hospital. Yeah, that falls under Department of Health and Wellness. Cheryl the, new, West the new mental health hospital? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Cheryl West That's good, thanks, Chair. Uh, Cheryl, this, no. Uh, yes, I don't have anybody else. Shall the section carry? Uh, transportation infrastructure capital to fund additional capital expenditures related to unbudgeted road and bridge work required. Total, three million three hundred thousand. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much. Could you give us a description of where those dollars were spent on what bridges and what roads? Um, I know it was bridge repairs due to Hurricane Fiona. Um, let's see if I have the details. 
Uh, yeah, so Darnley Bridge, French Village Bridge, Surrey West Bridge were kind of the three three components of that bridge. Leader of the Opposition. So was there any pavement involved other than the pavement of obviously to go over those bridges and lead up to them? No, not, not in this, uh, not in this. I think you'll see that in another section. Okay, so. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So a, for clarification, the $3,300,000 was spent on three bridges only, correct? Right, that's what that allocation is for yeah. in 23-24 is maybe yeah. when you'll see additional uh, special warrants for paving. In so. Schedule B, yeah. yeah. Okay. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Agriculture and land to fund additional operating expenditures related to the Fiona Agricultural Support Program. Total, 8281000 Shall it carry? Yeah. Economic growth, tourism, and culture to fund additional operating expenditures related to the Labor Market Development Agreement and the Digital Skills for Youth Program. Total, $1,260,000. Uh, leader of the Third Party. I'm wondering what additional expenditures you saw associated with the Labor Market Development Agreement. really uh, I think it was just a, a new uh, agreement was signed and therefore it bumped up what was allocated for that year um, so really that was partially uh, the digital skills for youth program was offset by the 340,000 um, really my notes just say that it was a provision for employment related services under the labor market agreement Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carried. Tourism PEI. To fund expenditures related to tourism PEI operations, total $6,832,000. Leader of the Opposition. Almost $7 million spent to fund expenditures related to tourism PEI operators. Can you please uh, just give us more, elaborate on what that, those dollars went to and why? Sure. Yes, yeah, some larger components. Um, Again, Hurricane Fiona related cleanup expenses that wouldn't have put it into <coughs> the capital category. Um, so there's about 1.5 uh, million there. That's a large chunk of it. Um, there was a program launched called the Tourism Seasonal Extension Recovery Program. It's another large por portion. Um, there was an airline recruitment program um, that was launched. Um, Canadian Heritage Agreement. Uh, that one's offset by revenue as well. That was to fund PEI Islander Appreciation Concert Series. Um, and then ACOA kicked in some money to assist with tourism marketing initiatives as well. Uh, so those are the large jumps. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So I just find it difficult to say COVID related was only 1.5, and that leaves still over $5 million just for what you had mentioned. Um, you had mentioned something about. Um, um, air service also. Can you uh, expand on that? Yeah, it was uh, airline recruitment program um, funding the, the Charlottetown Airport to recruit additional flights and airlines to increase capacity. Chair? Leader of the Opposition. And how much money was spent on that? That one's a, a million. And Leader of the Opposition. So how did that go? I, I, I can't speak to that. Okay. I guess we'll save that question for later. Would be the okay. Big draw there. Yeah. And yeah. I think those are so it's only flights. Thanks, Chair. Leader of the opposition. So can you confirm that it's it's only Porter? Uh, Porter? I, I think that they work with all airlines trying mm -hmm. to increase their flights. I think Porter would be a success story out of that. Okay. Leader of the opposition. No, that's fine, Chair. Show the section. Uh, Cheryl, what's your reality? Concerts? Did you say concerts? Um, it was through Canadian Heritage, Heritage Agreement to fund the PEI Islander Appreciation Concert Series. It was 100% offset by revenue. Um, it was around uh, 700 as part of that allocation. <laughs> good, I'm good, sir. Thanks. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Education and lifelong learning to fund exp expenditures related to post secondary and continuing education grants. Total $6,125,000. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering what additional grants 
um, did we need an additional six million dollars for? I'm just wondering if we underestimated how many students would qualify. Uh, no, that the largest portion of that is um, grants to Holland College and, and UPI uh, for additional operating money to support ventilation and upgrades and uh, Fiona recovery costs as well, those facilities. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carried. French Language School Board to fund expenditures related to the operation of the French Language School Board total, 2225000 Shall I carry? Carried. A public schools branch to fund expenditures related to the operation of the public schools branch. Total eleven million five hundred five hundred fifty thousand. Shell and Wishardy. That be four. That's a that's a big numbers. Up. That's not for salaries, obviously. In this, it's for. Yeah. There there was some post COVID supports that were added um, to public schools branch, so that is is a pressure for sure. Um, they did experience. Um, Diesel fuel and, and school bus maintenance uh, pressures as well, as well as like heating fuel and repair costs, just an increase in those costs. Cheryl, I was wrong. Is there a breakdown between the, the new electric buses and the old ones that were had to be repaired, or is that? No, I don't. I don't have that detail. Shall the section carry? Carry. Environment, Energy, and Climate Action to fund expenditures related to the provision of efficiency PEI solar and energy efficient equipment rebate programs. Total two million seven hundred ninety nine thousand eight hundred. Shall I carry? Sure. Fisheries and Communities to fund expenditures related to the real property tax credit program due to higher property value assessments and higher construction than expected. One million two hundred thirty three thousand eight hundred. Shall I carry? Sure. Health PEI to. Health PI to fund additional operating expenses primarily related to the COVID-19 response and salary pressures, $12,464,800. Charlton West Royalty. What's the breakdown between those? There's two different things in there for $12 million. Um, that was last year. Uh, it's How much was in salaries and, and where, what positions did they go to? Um, I don't have the list of specific positions that they went to. Um, I know... Uh, some things that are included in that are like nursing incentives, um, collective agreement increases from uh, expired union contracts actually being uh, finalized. Um, then the other portion is that, that COVID, COVID response uh, funding as well. Um, so those are the two largest, largest portions. Uh, Cheryl, how much royalty? So would that be the $8 million nursing incentives and the, uh, in that? Uh, yeah, that would be that would be a portion of that. Cheryl, how much royalty? I guess. I mean, can't ask stuff in the future, but I, don't, I still don't know why the, why nobody else got any bonuses in the in the entire system. And I guess would we find that in the future, if that's going to happen, would we find that in the capital budget on Schedule A and as a as a special, as a special if, warrant? If it's something that's not. Um, necessarily budgeted for and it's an additional expenditure outside of their appropriation vote it, and, and this would be through operating budget in either case. Um, if, if, if it was a pressure it's above their existing separate. vote or budget, then mm -hmm. it would be a special warrant that would be um, Yeah, down. absolutely. Yeah. Cheryl, thank you Cheryl. So that indicates it was approved by government. It came through finance and you and, and everybody there approved this eight million dollars and it, it's, executive council approved. it's executive council approved, correct? Well, a big part of this is collective agreement, like the labor market adjustments within the collective agreements that were done in that year, which with is a big piece of that. Cheryl Van Westro. The minister, we just talked about that being excluded outside of the labor market. Mm -hmm. That's part of that in here, but that $8 million was a special warrant by this government um, who, who uh, you know, it, it did divide the, the definitely the... The healthcare communities within within PEI. Yeah, the, the the eight the eight million isn't necessarily specifically the amount in here. Like included in eight point four million of this twelve million is nursing incentives, collective agreement increases. There's kind of three, so there's no specific amount for how much of that was for nursing incentives. Just so I'm clear. Yeah. 
Show number four. The last thing I'll ask is, can we have a complete breakdown of that section before we approve $12 million in a special warrant section that divided our health care system pretty much? Can, we, can you bring that back to us or send it to us by, I don't know, email or something? Um, we, we need to see what's, I mean, if this passes today, I'd like to see a breakdown of that section because um, it's, it's very important. That, so you're, you, you want a breakdown of the 8.4 of, of the whole, the 12 million? I want to, yes, breakdown of the $12 million and how it was divided and... Mm -hmm. okay. Jordan might have some extra information that might help. Yeah, so COVID response was 9.7 of that 12. Um, nursing incentives was four and a half. Um, collective agreement in increases um, 2.7. Um, there's there's a couple other line items here too. Uh, Pharmacy Plus program two and a half. Uh, medical surgical supplies a million and a half. Other pressures for utilities heat and fuel two million. And some of these were offset by um, you know out of province health services fluctuate each year depending on the number that's actually served. So that list would be offset partially by out of province services in the production there. So that's that's really the breakdown there. Uh, yeah. Leader of the third period. My question. Oh, sorry. The question I was going to ask. So is there any money in that $12 million being that's been given to uh, long-term care facilities after all the stuff we heard from COVID? I'm wondering if there was anything put into that. I'm not specifically sure what's under the COVID response, the 9.7 there. I know there is an allocation there for grants to private nursing homes as well included in that, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Shall the section here? Here, here. Justice and public safety to fund additional operating expenditures related to Hurricane Fiona response, 35798000 Shall it carry? Social development and housing to fund additional operating expenditures related to the delivery of the Seniors Independent Initiative, 165000 Shall it Just quickly. Um, what would that be, the 165 dollars before? Did we go over on that program? Um, it is just based on an increase in the average number of clients. Um, Increasing from in 22-23. Shall it carry? Carry. Sure. Transportation and infrastructure to fund additional operating expenditures related to Hurricane Fiona response, 11430000 Shall it carry? Sure. Interest charges on debt to fund additional operating expenditures related to the financing of the province's short-term and long-term debt, uh, total $12,340,000. Uh, Cheryl, what's your I just want to say that we're, if we're going to practice and we're going to talk about fiscal prudence of looking at it, and when we're presented with a $120 million, um, I know some of this money is offset federally. Um, that's that's an awful lot of, of special warrants out. Um, in, in that's that's an enormous amount of taxpayers' dollars that that's going out and. And uh, I would have liked some more time to scrutinize this, but we don't have it. But I just want to make that point. But um, I'll be, we'll be looking at this number in the future. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Uh, shall I carry? Sure. Total special warrants, 120539900 Shall I carry? Sure. All right, members. We're going to into uh, Schedule B on page 13. Agricultural cap agricultural agriculture capital uh, total fifty thousand. Shall I carry? Sure, sure. Education in early years capital total sixty million three hundred and ten thousand. Shall I carry? Uh, Cheryl Tamas Royalty. I just have to ask. Like I I don't. Can you say all of these ones have um, are, are specific to something that I I will maybe let it to go to Jordan just so I understand what. What we're talking about here. Yeah. So the page seven, uh, that in, those entire ones where they're like uh, expenditure, and then there's a sequestration offset right beside it. Yeah. This is really just to capture that there was a, a reorganization of government. So the existing capital budget that was approved last year okay. had to be reallocated to these new departments. Okay. Um, the new department names. So that's all it is. So it's zeros. Zero net zero. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's just a reallocation. <laughs> That's what I thought. I just didn't get them started. 
Shall I carry? Yes. Fisheries, tourism, sport, and culture. Capital. Total. One million six hundred seventy-five thousand. Shall I carry? Yes. Housing, land, and communities. Capital. Uh, total. Sixty million nine hundred seven thousand one hundred. Shall I carry? Yes. Social development and seniors. Capital. Total. Three million eight hundred ninety thousand. Shall I carry? Yes. Transportation infrastructure. Capital. Uh, total twenty five million nine hundred and twenty thousand. Shall I carry? Yeah. Total special warrants one hundred. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. So most of these are net zeros so if we just describe it. This would be the exception to that. Can you give us a bit of explanation on that? Yep. Um, there was pressures identified from transportation infrastructure uh, for a number of items that. Um, you know, they they knew about early, so they came and requested a special warrant for that additional spending. Uh, one of them we kind of already talked about was that larger purchase of land, uh, the sister St. Martha's land. Yep. That's uh, a significant portion, as well as that addition to the Canada Nature Fund agreement. Uh, there was some additional provincial paving and bridges and collector and highways as well, included in that $25 million. Okay. Chair? Yeah, New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So the net... Warrants for 23-24 are essentially that that amount. Um, last year, the special warrants were 200 million or so. So, uh, um, I'm. I, gu I guess the first question is: uh, Are we expecting more special warrants in the last three months of the year to m make up that difference, or like what's what are you expecting? Yeah. No. The expectation. Um, at this point wouldn't be that the, we'd have the level of special warrants that we did last year. One major factor was Hurricane Fiona in 22-23. Of course. Mm -hmm. A lot of costs got um, accrued, even if they were incurred in 23-24. Accounting would put them back into 22-23. Mm -hmm. So that resulted in a lot of special warrants. Um, it's one thing, like when you look at 22-23 and the pressures in there in Q2 or a Q3 forecast, you kind of look to next year and see uh, should budget be allocated to those departments to offset some of those pressures. Um, so like for instance, this capital special warrant, there was an addition to uh, Department of Transportation's capital for next year to hopefully um, you know, reduce the need for special warrants in the future. Okay, Chair? Yeah, New Haven Rocky I Point. think my last question, thanks. So there's a large offset of about 126 million. Is that, is that revenue largely federal? That 126 million is actually under the sequestration offset, and sequestration that relates to just the reallocation of the departments, the reorg. So it's not actually revenue; it's it's just a reallocation. Okay. So no, no revenue. Okay. That's good. I'm good for this section. Thank you. Uh, shall that section carry? Uh, shall the supplement supplemental estimates carry? Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the chair and that the Chair make report to Madam Speaker. Shall I carry? Carry. You can ask.
Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, I wish to report that the Committee has gone into supplementary supply to be granted to His Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directed to report to the House whenever he should be pleased to receive the same. Shall it carry? Sure. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, that the report of the Committee be now received. Shall it carry? Madam Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. Tell it carry. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that uh, the 11th order of the day be now read. Tell it carry. Order number 11, Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2024, Bill number 43, order for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall it carry? Bill number 43, Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2024, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair committee of the whole. The House is now committed to the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be a titular Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures, 2024. Uh, would you like to make a minister? Would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall it carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Didn't even allow you to introduce yourself. <laughs> I move the title. Shall uh, where am I here? Yeah, you're right. Just one second. Appropriation Act Capital Expenditures 2024. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. May it, do I stand? Uh, may it please your honor, we, His Majesty's dutiful and loyal servants, the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, towards appropriating the sev several supplies raised for the ex existencies of His Majesty's government and for other purposes herein mentioned, here and after mentioned, do humbly beseech that it be enacted. Be it therefore enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall I carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move that this move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment shall I carry <laughs> madam speaker chair of the committee of the whole house sending under consideration a bill to be a titular appropriation act capital expenditures 2024 i beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same without Amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Order division, please. Our recorded division has been requested. Uh, Honorable Deputy Sergeant at Arms, you may ring the bell. <laughs>
Uh, Governor's right to vote. Honourable members, all those go voting against the report, please stand. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honourable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, and the Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Members, all those voting in favour of the report, please stand. Honourable Minister of Education and Early Learning, the Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Premier, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Honourable Member from Kensington Malpac, the Honourable Member Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, the Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Honourable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness, the Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot, the Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald, the Honourable Member from Surrey Elmira, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, and the Honourable Member from Morel Donut. Honourable Members, the report has passed. Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the 12th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry. Order number 12, Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2023, Bill number 44, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I moved, seconded by the Honourable Premier, that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall it carry. Bill number 44, Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2023, ordered, or, pardon me, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Bill Carey. The Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled the Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2023. Uh, Minister, do you want to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall it carry? Could you introduce yourself? Jordan McNally, Executive Director of Fiscal Management. Thank you. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Carried. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I move the title. Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2023. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. May it please your honor, be it therefore enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall I carry? carry? Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall I carry? carry. Just a second there. <laughs> Boys, just a second. You're next. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intentional Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2023, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall carry. 
the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm seeking unanimous consent to proceed to third reading on Bill Number 43, the Appropriation Act 2024, which was read a second time today. Does the member have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance that the bill number 43 be now read a third time. Shall I carry? Bill number 43, Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2024, read a third time. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance that the said bill do now pass. <laughs> this is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to a committee of the whole House, reported to, agreed to, without amendment, Read a third time and is now moved that the bill do now pass. All those in favor say yay. Yay. Contrary minded nay. The, the bill has carried. <coughs> Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm, I'm seeking unanimous consent to proceed to third reading for bill number 44, Supplementary Appropriation Act 2023, which was read a second time today. Does the member have unanimous consent or yes, support? Yes. Yeah. Honorable Minister, sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the si bill number 44 be now read a third time. Bill Carey. Carey. Bill number 44, Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2023, read a third time. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the said bill do now pass. Bill Carey. Carey. This is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to a committee of the whole House, reported to and agreed to without amendment, read a third time, it is now moved that the bill do now pass. All those in favor say yay. Yay. Contrary minded nay. Nay. The bill has carried. Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth orders of the day be now read. Shall carry. carry. Order number four, an act to amend the Financial Administration Act number two, bill number 26, ordered for third reading. Order number six, Loan Act 2023, bill number 38, ordered for third reading. Order number seven, an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, bill number 39, ordered for third reading. Order number eight, an act to amend the Planning Act number two, bill number 40, ordered for third reading. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honorable Premier, that the said bills do now pass. No. Have you read a third time? Shall carry? Carry. Bill number 26, an act to amend the Financial Administration Act number 2, read a third time. Bill number 38, Loan Act 2023, read a third time. Bill number 39, an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, read a third time. Bill number 40, an act to amend the Planning Act number 2, read a third time. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the said bills do now pass. Honorable Members, these are bills introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to a committee the whole House reported, agreed to without amendment, as the case may be, read a third time, it is now moved that the bills do now pass. All those in favor say yay. yay. Contrary nay. The bills carried. <coughs> Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I wish to advise that this concludes business that government wishes to conduct during this fall season. Honorable Members, I've been advised that the Honorable Lieutenant Governor will be arriving at the Honorable George Cole's building shortly. I will leave the chair and invite Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, to join us in the chamber to receive the House and to grant royal assent to the various bills passed by this Speaker. Sorry, by this House.
Governor, Prince Edward Island, request permission to enter the chamber. Your Honor, the Legislative Assembly has passed certain bills during this, the first session of the 66th, 67th General Assembly, and now begs Your Honor's consideration of the grant of royal assent for the following bills. An Act to amend the Health in Information Act, Bill Number 3. An Act to amend the Police Act, Bill Number 7. An Act to amend the International Commercial Arbitration Act, Bill Number 8. An Act, part, pardon me, Arbitration Act, number, Bill Number 9. An Act to amend the Roads Act, Bill Number 10. An Act to amend the si Highway Signage Act, Bill Number 11. An Act to amend the Environmental Protection Act, Bill Number 12. Adult Guardianship and Trusteeship Act, Bill Number 19. Public Guardian and Trustee Act, Bill Number 20. Powers of Attorney and Personal Directives Act, Bill Number 21. An Act to amend the Legal Professions Act, Bill Number 2, Bill Number 22. An Act to amend the Opioid Damages and Health, Co Health Care Cost Recovery Act, Bill Number 23. Government Reorganization Act, Bill Number 24. An Act to amend the Agriculture Insurance Act, Bill Number 25. An Act to amend the Financial Administration Act, Number 2, Bill Number 26. An Act to amend the Archaeology Act, Bill Number 27. Mental Health Act, Bill Number 28. An Act to amend the Amusement Devices Act, Bill Number 29. An Act to amend the Policy Act, Number 2, Bill Number 30. An Act to amend the Liquor Control Act, Bill Number 31. Child Youth and Family Services Act, Bill Number 32, an Act to amend the Adoption Act, Bill Number 30, an Act to amend the Intercountry Adoption Hague Convention Act, Bill Number 34, an Act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, Bill Number 36, an Act to amend the Municipal Government Act, Bill Number 37, Loan Act 2023, Bill Number 38, an Act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, Bill Number 39, an Act to amend the Planning Act Number 2, Bill Number 40. Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2023, Bill Number 44. An Act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Bill Number 106. An Act to amend the Employment Standards Act Number 3, Bill Number 109. An Act to, to, an act to amend an Act to incorporate Amalgamated Dairies Limited, Bill Number 200. In His Majesty's name, I assent to these bills. May it please Your Honour, we, His Majesty's loyal and dutiful subjects of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, in session assembled, approach Your Honour at the close of our labours with sentiments of unfeigned devotion and loyalty to His Majesty's person and government. We do humbly beg for Your Honour's acceptance of the following bill entitled Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2024, thus placing at the disposal of the Crown the means by which government can be made efficient for the, pro for the service and welfare of this province. Her Honour, the Honourable Lieutenant Governor doth thank His Majesty's loyal and dutiful subjects, accepts their benevol benevolence and assents to this bill in His Majesty's name. I wish to commend all the honourable members for the, con the conscientious manner in which you have conducted your deliberations to this point of the first session of the 67th General Assembly of Prince Edward Island. At this time, I pray that until the Legislative Assembly again meets, each of you enjoy good health and prosperity and that peace and freedom for all people shall be more nearly achieved. J'aimerais vous souhaiter aussi la, les meilleurs vues de la saison euh, de Noël, du temps des fêtes. J'espère que ce sera un temps de renouvellement et de réjouissement avec vos êtres chers. I would like to extend to all honourable members my, season, my expression of season's greetings. I really do hope that this period of uh, holidays will give you a renewed energy 
and that that will come from your connections with your family and friends. Enjoy them, taste the goodness of friendship and the love of family, as well as that stuffed turkey. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I will see you in the new year and uh, be well, be well, especially. Thank you. Honourable members, before putting the question, I just want to wish each and every one of you a very Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, enjoy your family, enjoy your time together, forget the stuff, and think about your friends, and uh, just relax, let's get renewed, as Her Honour said, and be back here in 2024 with uh, a renewed spirit to be here for Prince Edward Islanders. So, Merry Christmas, and I'll call the question. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Premier that this House adjourn and stand to the call of the Speaker. Shall it carry? Carry.